In a world where nostalgia rages across the land, where everyone and their mother has a podcast, where there's still a movie trailer guy who says, in a world, three friends revisit films, shows, and games that molded them as they search for answers to life, the universe, and everything in between. Settle in and join us for Screen Refresh. Welcome back to Screen Refresh, a show where we revisit the films, shows, and games from our childhood to try and take another look at what we fell in love with. As always, I'm Dean, and I'm joined by the rest of the Screen Refresh crew, Nick and Tim. Hello there. Kawabunga. Kawabunga. So, Dean, this is something from all of our childhoods. What did you choose? Is it? Oh, yeah. Is it? Yeah. I thought you guys were haters on the first movie. Um, I never, this is... I'd never seen this movie before. Uh, <laughs> this was my first time viewing. It is Sex, Lies, and Videotape. Soderbergh? Uh, <laughs> Wait, was that Soderbergh? <laughs> that is Soderbergh. Oh, okay. Um, no, this is a different independent film. This is Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, 1990. Teach Ninja. Teach Ninch Mooch Turtles, the highest grossing independent film of all time for 10 years. Because it was until, I think, what, Blair Witch? Uh Uh-huh. And then I think Blair Witch was until Paranormal Activity? Sure. That makes sense. So it's the only non-ghost-based top grossing film. I don't don't know. know. There was that scene in, like, the halfway point where it was... (laughs) True. Like, I always know it's upcoming, but in my notes, I'm like, well, and this is the part where it gets a little supernatural, and then it goes right back to normal. <laughs> I don't know what movie this unseated for the top uh, grossing independent film spot. Star Wars. I think, yeah, maybe that was it. I think a lot of people <laughs> were, are surprised to find this This was independent, technically. Like, no studio wanted, they thought it was going to flop, I think. They owe that to, like, Masters of the Universe or something. On paper, it is a really abstract idea. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, Kevin uh, Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird, the creators, just were, like, fucking around drawing things one night. And, like, yeah, this is kind of funny and dumb and cool. I I mean, at the start of your elevator pitch has to be, you know, like, look, just hear me out. You know it's going to be a rough pitch. (laughs) (laughs) Some of the best State of the end. Uh, properties uh, started that way, I'd, I'd imagine. It uh, it didn't compete against much when it came out. No, back. yeah. That, <laughs> it's, I, I noted like it came out a week after Pretty Woman and a week before Ernest Goes to Jail. Yeah. Um, and there's some other movies that I'm familiar with, but nothing that was like, oh, that came out. Yeah, it was the the split demographic of do I go see the Fighting Turtles, uh, Pretty Woman, Hunt for Red October, or House Party with Kid and Play? House Party, right. I never saw that one. Neither have I. It's okay. Catch us next time on... Oh. This was March 30th, by the way, 1990. Um, and oh, so actually we're coming the- up... Wait, was that intentional? I forgot. Uh, it, well, it it informed my decision here to do this as the next movie, um, because it'll just be a couple days past the twenty. I'm oh, sorry, f- is it forty second? Um, uh, no, thirty th- uh, second anniversary. It's an important one. Yeah, yeah, it surely is. Uh, it had a budget. Yeah, speaking of <laughs> the gross, a Doesn't budget everything? of thirteen point five million. <laughs> Thirteen point five million, which still seems like a lot to me, for that time. Well, I love when um, I, like I understand independent films or like indie films. It's just they don't have a studio. But in my head, I've always thought of like indie films and independent films as like oh, like lower budgets, and all of them are like yeah, we're scraping by on three million. <laughs> which is, I mean, in the grand scheme of things, yeah, that's. Like some of these are shoestring budgets or like 500,000 to do the movie, but it's still, it's funny thinking of it as like, oh yeah, it's, we made it with dirt and sticks. The thing I don't understand though, and it goes along with like John Williams too, and that 
how do you make this quote unquote like low budget film that no one expects, but you managed to get a huge name attached to it? Like Jim Henson's like workshop was able to do the turtle suits. They're pretty big. So I don't understand (laughs) on, you know, if it wasn't for Jim Henson, this movie would have flopped. It was a huge mandatory thing on having those suits worked. I read something that Steve Barron, the director, was working on something w- with Jim Henson or of Jim Henson's. I forget under what uh, role, but yeah, that I know- link somehow he did it as like a favor, and he Cause- reportedly was not happy with the violence in the movie afterwards. But oh, I, I don't know how you realize that when you you're film they're filming the scenes of the violence. Like, how do you realize? How do you not think it's going to be violent? Well, the, considering the title of you know teenage mutant ninja <laughs> turtles. Yeah, it could have been bullshit, but yeah, I, I never understood that. Yeah, I don't know who financed the movie. I don't know who put up the money. Who invested? Golan Globus in this. <laughs> Canon Films. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, you're right, though. That, if they would have Jim been people Henson, painted green if they had funded, funded the movie. <laughs> if we didn't have the, the Jim Henson company doing the suits and whatnot for this, I mean, I think the movie, I love the the writing, I love the characters, I love all the like the set and everything they've done, but without the suits and for them to be able to work out of the suits, like if they had this looking like garbage pail kids in terms of the, the costumes for them, I don't think we would be doing an episode on it today. Oh, yeah, no. Yeah, you're right. Um, they pushed, Jim Henson had said that, you know, they pushed like this was the most advanced stuff they had done at the time. And this was um, after they made a frog walk. You guys in remember that, that movie mm-hmm. I saw that you're talking about? I definitely know what it is. I that think it was a uh, Muppet Steak Manhattan. Or a great oh, Muppet Kermit. Kermit. I was like, what frog are you talking about? Yeah, that, that was like a yeah, big sorry. mind-blowing thing at the time of being like, oh, it's always the Muppets. And all of a sudden they're like, and we're making him walk. Talk about breaking <laughs> the fourth wall. You actually see the guy this time. Yeah. <laughs> Not just from the waist up. It was it like he was walking or he was riding a bicycle? I remember in Christmas Carol, they made him walk. And it blew my mind as a kid. I forget which one. I think he rides a bike in Carol. So you mentioned Steve Barron. The only other thing I know him from, he does like a ton of music videos and he did Coneheads. Yeah, his 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 uh, credits kind of start in the early 80s. Like it's like music video, music video, like bit with big artists. And then all of a sudden, you know, there's a, a TV pilot or something. And then there's Turtles in the 90s and then back to music videos, back to music videos. And Coneheads I mean, in nine, 93. It, if you crank out a ton of music videos and then at some point in your career just make Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and even like Coneheads, I think it's not a bad career overall. No, no. I wonder between Turtles and Coneheads if he was trying to like, look, I made, I directed this freaking hit with a low budget. Like, was he, did he, did he have to work hard to get Coneheads or like, where did that fall into play? Well, I don't yeah. know. Because if I recall, like, I mean, this is, as you said, was the highest grossing indie film for ages. And I don't think Coneheads did poorly. So I'm wondering like what the case was of we yeah. didn't get more projects like this or why didn't he come back for two or. Cause his next movie after Coneheads was the Jonathan Taylor Thomas live action Pinocchio movie, which I don't <laughs> know how that did. I don't, I don't really remember that. I don't think that's gone down in film history, but that won't um, be popping up. <laughs> Boop. The uh, the writers Todd Langan and Bobby Harbeck really didn't do much. One or both of them did some TV uh, episodes. I think Todd did the first and the second movie. Or yeah. They both did, and that's pretty much their the end of their writing. Yeah, and then I know um, Harbeck. Produced, wrongfully accused. Oh, he did? <laughs> Unrelated, but terrific. I like that movie. That's up my alley. Yeah. That has some really good moments in it. I'll choose that movie next. Let's not talk, <laughs> let's not talk about it at all. Um, apparently, Robin Williams. I didn't realize Judith Hogue. So, Judith Hogue plays April O'Neil, our, pretty much our main character. It was originally supposed to be Robin Williams? 
<laughs> Robin Williams. <laughs> what hey, <set>? turtles. turtles. <laughs> no, that was that was the Shredder. Now I just want to see Robin Williams as Shredder. <laughs> just that, just how long that final scene would be if when he's just like monologuing, like going like coked out Robin style. Um, he was in uh, Cadillac Man. I guess I didn't realize Judith Hogue was in that, but I guess I never really saw the movie. Um, and I, I guess had <laughs> showed Judith like the comics and like, hey, you're gonna be April O'Neil. Like, I'm a fan of the Turtles. I had no <laughs> idea. What a guy. <laughs> Helped her get into character. Um, Which it's it's fun hearing stories like that. It's like he's not involved in the project, but it's just he gets to share things he loves with other people. Also, speaking to the runaway smash success of the movie, Corey Feldman, who voices Donatello, said he was only offered $1,500 to do the voice work. And they were like, this is a low budget thing that we're praying we just get money on VHS. And uh, yeah, it was a little more successful than that. Which I assume he wasn't like probably hurting for money at the time with the string of him. All the, the I Corey guess not movies. yet, because this would have been like 89 when yeah. he, so, I mean, he did like, the this voice was work. Lost Boys, Friday the 13th Part 4. But so I wonder why he said, yeah, sure, I'll just do this voice work. Or maybe, did he like the turtle? I don't know. I mean, growing up in the 80s, it very well could have been a case of like, he read the comics or knew of the comics. That it was That's just true. like, oh, this is fun. That's a good point. That's a great point. I love him as Donnie. Um, yeah, he was, he's, I love the, the personalities and the, I thought there was all great choices for the guys in the suits did a great job. And then the, the voice cast, I thought was like perfect between the voice actors and then the, the actors in the suits for the physicality. Like if we took the, the bandanas or whatever off of them, so we couldn't see the color you can still tell all of them apart in terms of just the the personality, the actions and everything. So, right. I think that's and, the, the great thing. And uh, yeah, take their masks off. Just the sculpt of the faces is is visually different. They're not just copy and pasted. Yeah. Which by the I know the Henson didn't do the third movie, but in the third movie they're like literally like the same people. <laughs> <laughs> they, if you took the masks off, you wouldn't know who who anybody was, but they have very distinct I put up with the fighting, but I draw the line at time travel. My turtles are pulled. <laughs> there was, I mean, they're guys in suits. There, there's a couple moments that stick out to me as like, eh, this, this takes me out a little bit just of knowing, really showing that there's a suit there. But <laughs> for you the talking about part, that one scene like, with Donnie when he's standing in the doorway while after Raph terrifying. wakes up? <laughs> I think it's that's a terrifying. that's I think that's more of a hidden one because I I think if you didn't know it you wouldn't be looking for that and you would miss I just, it. It's I only a couple to, frames. <laughs> I happened to look up from my notes just when like they did the lap and all of a sudden it was like it's like a second set of teeth inside that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I never for some reason I thought like that was like enhanced and brightened, but no, it's as clear as day if you pause it on that those couple frames. Yeah, it's just which, it's not extremely glaring because it's it, it happens fast. But once you know it's there, then you know it's there every time. Uh, I so, mean, yeah, the cast. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, like, even the there was nothing that pulled me out in terms of the stuff like that. Like you said, it, it was only a couple frames. Um, even the scenes where they're sitting and you see the seam where the head connects to the neck. But I mean, even that can be like. They got garroted. <laughs> Mutant it's, wrinkles. It's an old scar. <laughs> we all got Splinter cut in the same a, place. Splinter was a tough teacher. <laughs> it was the uh, the plastic six pack rings. <laughs> <laughs> you did this to us. Yeah, they should have done a PSA for plastic recycling and things like <laughs> that. Make sure you cut your six pack plastic holders. Michelangelo turns and he's like crying. Um, <laughs> Does anybody so remember the cast, that? Yeah. The cast, uh, April O'Neil, Judith Hogue, um, 
who I guess went on to do, I think her other big thing is Halloween Town, like that yep. she's known for. Yeah, I think she was. Which I never saw. I just like, I'm aware of that, I guess. And she was in Cadillac Man with Rob Williams, <laughs> which I just learned. Um, Didn't he show her the comics? To, oh, never mind. <laughs> I heard that somewhere. Um, Casey Jones is played by Elias Cotiz. Cotiz or Cotiz? Has anybody ever heard Cotiz? that pronounced? Cotiz. I don't know. It's not Elias Cotiz. It's Elias Cateus. Elias Cateus. Apologies, Mr. Cateus, if you're listening. And if you're not listening, then we don't apologize. Nobody tell him. All I know is I like him and he will continue to show up in everything from here on out. You know what's funny? Oh, you mean because we're watching it now and talking about it? Well, no, just I remember seeing this as a kid and then just seeing him pop up in so many random movies. And every time I'm I, like, oh, hey, it's Elias Cotes. I have such the opposite reaction where I barely saw him in anything ever. I think I know that he's in Zodiac and like, that's all I can think of. He was also in um, Fallen with Denzel. Remember that movie? Didn't see it. The serial killer that jumps bodies. I think I probably just dodged his movies unknowingly throughout uh, the rest of my life. But he does yeah. a great job. They, Judith and Elias both do a great job. And plus they play, play well together. Yes. Yeah, I felt they had good chemistry. I didn't they doubt do. really any actor's portrayal in any of the roles, despite how outlandish the whole movie concept is. Everyone took it seriously, and it really pays off that they did. Yeah, it is yeah. really grounded. Despite, yeah. I think that's one of the big things that helps the whole movie itself. When I watched it this time, I actually tried to look at it in a more critical way and it held up. It didn't kind of get destroyed through overthinking certain things. Everything had motive. It was there. A lot of it was subtle. And this kind of viewing made me appreciate this one a lot more than the sequel, which has always been my favorite. But this one I've seen just as many times. But watching it this time around, I'm like, you know, let me let me kind of like examine things a bit deeper. And I was pretty surprised on how well it was able to do. Yeah, it pleases me. There's a lot more of the movie that I realized as a kid, like the whole duality of being a parent or a fatherhood through the eyes of Splinter versus the eyes of Shredder and all of that. fun And stuff. Charles. Yeah. Yeah. Fatherhood. Yep. I think the. The advantage they have here that would get lost in current ones is because they weren't CGI, the actors actually have something to play off of. They probably had like, they knew the people in the suits. So it was a case of, they are a little bit more realistic in terms of their portrayals. Um, Cause I think that's what's kind of more difficult for them to do now is you're looking at what, like a guy in golf balls or uh, <laughs> in a green suit. <laughs> Who's yeah, this, Mr. Golf Balls? <laughs> Just golf, golf balls. balls you needed on set. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta get him back to Staten Island. <laughs> Fucking Johnny Golf Balls over here. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's what every that's Mr. Person to is. you. <laughs> I Mr. Johnny Golf Balls. I studied at Juilliard. <laughs> Please, Mr. Golf Balls was my father. Call me Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. I think any actor would tell you, yes, I want to see and interact interact with real, tangible yeah. co-stars and not men in, in suits or just a, a, a tennis ball on the end of a long stick. Um, so that magic is lost nowadays, probably for the most part. Only to be brought back occasionally where like in like where the wild things are. Those were real suits with like CGI augmented faces, which is yeah. if they brought it back, I guess that's how it would be cool if they did it was just do the animation on the face CGI, but have everything else be real. That would be cool. It'd be cool if they did like another instead of time travel, do like enter the spider verse kind of thing and all the different turtle iterations come back <laughs> this time in a live action. I know they did that. In Roger Rabbit style. Uh, yeah, I know they did that in one of the shows more recently. It had like the, 
you know, the 90s cartoon in there, um, the early 2000s cartoon and a bunch of other different ones right. all mixed into the same show. But it'd be cool if they did a movie version instead. I mean, it's the mm-hmm. the whole meta now is a multiverse, so why not? That's right. We were, we were discussing that last episode. The Michael Bay ones, I, I did feel were a little over scrutinized, but at the same time, it was jarring to go from these turtles that we've grew up with for so long. And even all the cartoons were based off of them to something so radically different. It was a really tough pill to swallow. Yeah. I need to, I haven't seen the second of, (laughs) was it out of the shadows? Right. But it was the better one. The second movie I feel like was better. It was because it was more like the, the, the cartoon. Yeah. It, it just looked really weird because the turtles were nine yeah. feet tall and yeah, I'm still not down with the turtles' designs there, but yeah, um, agreed. The second movie just felt better. Oh, just a better movie, a better turtles movie. Agreed. Uh, the voices of the turtles, Josh Pays, who has popped up in a lot. He's I've seen him a lot more, in a lot more things. Um, he's the voice of Raph, but also the only turtle who also is inside this suit performing. Not the stunts, but just the regular scene acting. Uh, the voice actor is is also in the suit. Um, Brian Tochi plays Leonardo in all three movies. Uh, he's, I think we talked about this before, but he's in Revenge of the Nerds. Uh, he's one of the nerds. Never I forget the name, but oh, okay. Do, do That's you the know, only other thing I can think of. Where was who was this? Brian Tochi. That's the only thing I, I remembered from the last from when we watched the second movie. Looking him up. Oh yeah, he played. Yeah. Um. Damn, I don't know his name. <laughs> Takashi. Right. Um. Corey Feldman, of course, we talked about is Donatello, and Robbie Rist, who also was Michelangelo in all three movies. Brian and Robbie were the only two to play in all three of the movies. Robbie's Michelangelo. Uh, Kevin Clash plays Splinter. Splinter. He, he he was part of the puppeteering team, and he also provides the voice. James Saito is the Shredder, who I only remember seeing in uh, Always Be My Maybe, like that Netflix. Oh, wasn't that like the past couple years? That. Yeah, that was... Uh, yeah, like three year, three years ago or so. In pandemic years, it's like, yeah, it was well, right, right? last year. <laughs> Those are the big players. I, I didn't realize oh. that Shredder and Tatsu were both dubbed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I knew that wasn't James Sa- Saito? Saito's voice. Because Tatsu uh, was dubbed by uh, Michael McConaughey, who... No relation. Nick might know as Uther Lightbringer and Kel'Thuzad from WoW. Huh. <laughs> and uh, he was Zhang Liao and Zhu Tai in Dynasty Warriors. <laughs> it's Lu Bu! Do not pursue Lu Bu. David McCharen does the Shredder. I don't know. Did you look him up? I didn't look him up. No. I feel like that's a rabbit hole when you start looking at voice probably. actors. Because all of them have done a billion things that we probably know. I did like... On one hand, I'm conflicted with Shredder's voice because it sounds cool, but it's so obviously just, it's almost like he's wearing a vocal transformer. Um, but it does make him scarier, I guess, or more, seem more powerful with the, what they did to his voice. Only effort, discipline, loyalty, earn the right to wear the dragon doji. It'd be interesting to hear all the dialogue done in the just james's voice and how that sounded but it's like hearing darth vader's real voice through the mask <laughs> and it's just like some cockney british actor <laughs> and the same yeah, thing with like, balls. And same thing with like chewbacca <laughs> instead of the like little grunts and roars that he does it's just some british dude they should have had that like the deep sinister voice until he takes the mask off at the end to run after splinter and then just hear like ah. Oh, it was the mask the whole time. <laughs> I still don't know how that mask is, like, how that Attached. mask works. <laughs> yeah. Because I, I made Shredder's helmet for a cosplay years and years ago. I made the whole thing from scratch. And when it came time to adding in the, the mouth guard 
face shield thing that he has you see him just slide it right off but there's nothing attached to either end to attach to the helmet itself and i had i mean i figured out a way around it but in the movie terms you see it there and then he just slides it off without any issue and i i don't understand how that worked and there's no magnets so it's not like it was just held on there by some kind of super strong magnet because the rest of the helmet itself is a flimsy thin material it's not a it's not made out of like plastic or anything so it's it's still movie magic to me to this day wondering how the hell they constructed that helmet i think he was holding it in place with his tongue oh, the Jesus. entire time <laughs> so yeah i mean it is uh, uh the the whole costume itself i think really stands out amongst the whole movie too it's just yeah, the fabric, the glittery fabric seems weird. Like, if you described it to me, I'm like, why is Shredder wearing, like, glittering red? Uh, well, glitter, really. Like, red was his color in the comics. I think it's what they were going for. But, um... Yeah, even his cloak was, like, black and white tiger stripe. And just describing it sounds really off. <laughs> and, like, really? That's it? But when you see it in person and how, like, his big reveal and they lift the cloak up to reveal the blades that are on his shoulders, it, it's menacing as hell. And it's just the whole yeah. outfit fits. Yeah, like, the if they, they put him in too, just yeah. straight, like, a black outfit or something, it wouldn't have the same oomph. I, on one hand, it makes sense because, okay, this guy, he's got blades all over his armor. Like, he's obviously doing this for show. He's trying to stand out and like look and tr attract attention and try to make you scared. <laughs> you know, like a ninja master. <laughs> He's transcended ninja ninjutsu. He has other people do the work for him. Tiger though. stripe rhinestone. Like a rhinestone ninja. Unless he's that good. Maybe. Sam Rockwell. I don't know if this is Sam's first credit or not, but Sam Rockwell is the uh I don't know the head thug. I don't know if before before this or just after this, he did Clown House. Um, it was a the director of Jeepers Creepers, Victor Salva. Terrible guy, but did Clown House with Sam Rockwell early on. <laughs> oh, right, yeah. We didn't know at the time. Um, regular menthol, that's Sam Rock Rockwell's legacy here. That was his catchphrase for years. <laughs> Be sure to include include the clip of Gimli like Now we find a feasting on and smoking <laughs> The amount of uh underage illegal activities in this movie is appalling. Man, that warehouse was so cool. I wanted to go hang out at that warehouse. If if that existed when we were kids, we'd all be in the foot clan right now. <laughs> they knew what they were doing. I go found back my family. Here, this down there family. Yes. That's like literally Shredder's school for wayward boys. <laughs> <laughs> That's a deep cut. Uh, yeah, I guess let's dive in. Let's dive into 1990s know, Turtles. We'll, we'll get into it throughout this whole bit, but I think this <clears throat> is the most quotable movie we've done. I, I, I mean, I'm biased because I've been quoting it forever, but every scene there's something that like i was writing down lines every scene just of like yeah like e every single like every four bullet points there's a bullet point that's just a quote that it's like yeah i use this in my day-to-day -day life <laughs> i actually did the opposite i try to avoid that one because trust me they're there but i yeah. like i said i did the analytical approach to this and it's the first half of the entire movie is where the bulk of all of my notes are and it's, I felt it was a lot more insightful than my usual watchings. So the movie starts out uh, with a wide shot of New York City. We know where the hell we are. Um, April O'Neil is giving a report about a recent uh, crime wave that has been getting worse. And citizens are up in arms, wondering what, why the police aren't helping. They can't seem to stop it. Uh, and we're seeing just kind of shots of the city and then actually seeing some of these robberies take place. And here we get introduced to, we see Danny, uh, April's boss son, that we don't know if that's him yet, but somebody's pickpocketed. We kind of follow his wallet as it's passed around between different hoodlums. And finally, this kind of mysterious <laughs> ninja hand takes the uh, wallet from Danny. And it's... <laughs> 
<laughs> that always that shotgun makes me laugh the way he's kind of standing there waiting for it and then the guy takes it and he's kind of like Ugh. the one that makes me laugh is when you see the non or the the ununiformed guys bringing boxes or whatever to the back of the van and then it's yeah. two ninja from the foot clan just like looking out nervously <laughs> looking left right as they put things in a van i saw i just imagined because like Danny and another kid just run up from the same side. I just imagine there's like a line of a hundred people with different <laughs> stolen items just off screen waiting to run up to the van and, and hand it off. Like it looks a little, not cheap, but it, it looks chintzy the way they, they shoot some of the stuff at the beginning. But I mean, also, they'd probably be less noticeable if they didn't wear the costumes. Unless it was something that they just like got the rights to oh i finally made it full into the foot clan i get my whole ninja <laughs> outfit and damn it i'm gonna wear it it's funny to me that like the whole backstory to shredder and splinter and everything else regarding the foot clan seems like it's so romanticized that i keep forgetting it's not happening in feudal japan but it's happening like modern day because like during his whole explanation of like how he became who he was, like Yamato Yoshi could have simply have went to go to Blockbuster, picked up a movie, went back to his house kind of thing. Like that's how recent it was. But whenever <laughs> he tells the story, it really sounds like it happened hundreds of years ago when in reality it didn't. Because then it's like, yep, all right, so all of this happened and then Shredder just went over to Jersey. <laughs> this is your family. I am your father. And now he has a, you know, a warehouse right on the Hudson. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, if this is what like happened 20 years before the start of the movie, then it would have been, yep, we just got out of Jaws and now we're headed back. And now the battle <laughs> with Rokusaki. Splinter's like, then I went through the Lincoln Tunnel. <laughs> Get I, to America. I do like how, as you said, they do the opening with April O'Neil kind of at the newsstand. You see her on TV. We haven't introduced her yet. And she's explaining the crime wave. I like, I don't mind exposition when it happens organically like this of, granted, yes, this is information that's trying to get the audience up to speed on what's happening, but it's done in a way that it makes sense within the universe. Um, this, this movie too. Yeah, absolutely. In one of my later notes, but... This movie does an excellent job of showing and not telling. Because, yes, yeah. it's through a news broadcast and she's explaining everything, but you're actually seeing the robberies. You're actually seeing the things that are being described happen. And sometimes they don't even flat out tell you what's going on. You just have to literally watch the movie to figure out and put two and two together. Like there's a revelation later on that I was blown away that they didn't actually explain any of this. But having deep dive, looking into what's going on, it's like, wow, that actually makes sense. And this is cool. And this is a turtle movie. You wouldn't think that this would have like, you know, first class writing and reality. It, it, it stands up. This is the exact reason why it became one of the highest grossing. Yeah. Yeah. It definitely doesn't treat the audience like it's, it's kids watching it. I mean, not it, at all. It's not kids would. I mean, I love this. Kids love this movie, but. I I don't know. I couldn't see myself not liking this if I saw it at the time, I guess, you know, as a 30 year old. And don't don't um, think I, I'm, I'm bashing this movie whatsoever, be it you or the listener. But no, this is one of my own, you know, top movies of all time. I grew up watching this. This is like the hundredth viewing of seeing this movie already. You know, like it is a deep core memory of watching all of this stuff and i'm just so impressed on you know yes the special effects and the you know the suits are starting to show their age and all that but i mean it still holds up and i'm watching this as an adult and trying to leave like the nostalgia glasses away and trying to watch this as if it's the first time and i'm just so impressed on how it is able to keep up and it doesn't treat the viewer like they're you know like you said like they're they're stupid yeah. Also, I like how we see uh, somebody having Burger King, and it's the classic late '80s, <laughs> early '90s yeah. Burger King box and logo. Like the sandwich burger yeah, it reminds sandwich me of burger like um, when they're eating it on the top of the roof in Monster Squad. 
it's weird. I yearn for a New York that I was never alive for. I look at it and I'm nostalgic and it's like, I didn't eat Burger King until I was like 20. I was a McDonald's child. I wasn't even <laughs> New York until I was like 22. Yeah. I don't know why I'm Yours like, ah, oh, I miss it. I've never <laughs> known it. Tim, every time I brought you to New York, you've hated it. <clears throat> it's it's true. <laughs> Actually, no, There's... I hate I hate getting into and getting out of New York City proper. Right. Once you're just taking a subway and you're not driving anywhere, then it's a lot. If less I can teleport experience. directly to my destination, teleport directly out of New York City. I think there's a nostalgia just for not nostalgia, but I mean, there's something cool about the retro, the 70s and 80s. And I guess in this case, will be the end of the 80s. But well, just that style just kind of looks. Maybe it is just nostalgia. It's like what things look like when we were that that age and because it's odd because it's not like it's oh it was a, a dirtier grittier new york city is and it's not even a case of like oh it was a cleaner new york city than it is now it's just a different new york city entirely yeah well one well before we die well, i think we'll have time traveling figured out and maybe we can check it out yep yeah yeah <laughs> yeah agreed <laughs> I'm glad so, we all agree. Okay. April wraps up her report, and uh, by that time, the the movie opens in the daytime. Um, and by the time her report's done, the sun has gone down. I don't know how this is a three hour long news report going on. <laughs> I was but, gonna um, say, what is this like a Jerry's Kids uh, telethon? <laughs> and I will be reporting this crime wave in real time for the next seventeen hours. Our phones are open. She comes out the very, the least glamorous TV station door I've ever seen in my life. That's well, um, the 80s, man. <laughs> just like a back alley. Maybe it's the back, <laughs> I guess the back exit, I don't know. But she comes out sporting a yellow raincoat, which is a nod to the yellow jumpsuit that she wears in the cartoon. Which I'm glad they didn't try to pull that off in the movie. Um, that would have been strange. But she comes around the corner... First, sees a rat, um, which has no significance, I suppose. Uh, and then <laughs> finds Sam Rockwell and his entourage stripping the news van. And since they've caught her, she's going to get beat up, I guess. But just then, a sigh, Raphael's sigh, flies at the uh, light in the alley. And everything goes dark and you just hear... What's interesting is none of the guys like scream like Ugh, ah they just like take their punches like and just get knocked out. <laughs> they take their punches like men and just get knocked the fuck out. <laughs> yeah. There's no the, there's no screaming from the, the light dudes. Goes they out. Just get, well, you got me. <laughs> I always loved in movies. It's just the guy gets takes a hit from Batman and he just goes down. <laughs> I mean, you have to begin um, to think: is it that he actually gets knocked out instantly, or is he just like? I'm not standing up for a second punch. Was that a six foot turtle that just knocked me out? No, I'm I'm done. I'm done. I don't want to. <laughs> I had a good run. <laughs> the lights, well, it just flashes forward to the police arriving on the scene and everybody's tied up. Raphael is peeking out from the sewer where they presumably entered and exited from because his he didn't pick up his sigh and April finds it. And uh, she pockets it, and Ralph is not not too pleased. Damn. Which, damn. Damn. It's, it's okay. He can get it back. He can get it back. But I like how the as the lights are going, you don't see Ralph fully yet. It's just like flashes yeah. of his eyes from the sewer grate. Yeah, with the um, the police lights just kind of like yeah. flickering on, his, Which, on him. I mean, same thing they did with Shredder and whatnot. It's such a great way to slowly bring these characters into the forefront without just like and here you go yeah i like how it's grainy i i mean i think some of these choices probably owe to the fact that the uh, the budget of the movie but the dark like high contrast lighting and the grainy film like i don't know just like a cool look that i i thought really worked with it more credit to Jim Henson's workshop because the yeah. amount of detail they put into the eyes specifically with all of those close-ups, 
it it sells it. There, I said it before. I mean, it, there's not a single point where I don't believe I'm looking at a, a like I feel this is just a guy in a suit. One or <laughs> two scenes, man. sure, but consistently through the whole movie, it just I. The suspension of disbelief is easily there. I never think twice like, oh, it's just a guy in a suit acting. It's not a big deal. It's not. This is a walking, talking turtle. So Donatello, Michelangelo, and Leonardo are happily walking back to their lair as the theme. Well, not theme. I guess it's the theme of the movie. I don't, you don't ever hear this this music cue again, I think. But in my, in my head, I... Yeah, you do in my the, head, I associate this as much as as much as the cartoon theme song. Like this is also their theme song in my head, even though it's just a music cue here at the beginning of the movie. And I know both of you always say I'm wrong, but it really reminds me of the opening to Weird Science. Uh, after did we after have this the, like, conversation the, before, we have. <laughs> I don't and both of you guys have told me I'm wrong. I see the similarity, but just I didn't like weird science enough growing up for it to be like a core memory for me to relate to it. <laughs> oh, no, just the I mean, the the song. I don't I, don't, I can take or leave the movie. Oh, yeah. But I, I mean, no, but I mean, that's that's the whole thing in general. It's just I hear the similarities, but I don't it doesn't come into my head enough to say like, oh, yeah, I can hear the difference between the two. It's you have to play them side by side for me to actually hear yeah. the difference like the new batman theme sounding like the imperial march but now i have to listen to that <laughs> yeah yeah I, I get that it's the same kind of thing like the tones and the beat is there and you side by side you obviously hear the similarities but i don't hear it when i listen to just the turtles theme yeah the three of them are happy Raphael is lagging behind pissed about his sigh i think he says like damn three times here towards the beginning and each one is like with increasing intensity. <laughs> and this is a kid's movie. Yeah. Damn. It was the coolest swearing you could have heard as a kid. You're like, oh my God, my turtles are swearing. <laughs> this is not the cartoon. Like five it's minutes the same in, logo as the cartoon. But... I, I forgot how dark this movie was in terms of just subject matter and even with Raph cursing as much. I mean, like I get it. He lost the weapon. He's upset. And obviously, you know, like you said, it's grainy as hell and it's just really dark in a lot of the shots. But just the whole subject matter in general, I watched this as a kid. <laughs> yeah. Again, like I know we say this a lot about our movies, but there was they don't make them like they used to as far as the age age range. Certainly don't. And they don't make sewers like this anymore. Do they? Where are these sewers in New York? I, I feel like every real sewer is probably the size of, you know, a beach ball, maybe I mean, at the biggest. I hear the sewers in Connecticut are nice this time of year. <laughs> um, so they get back to their lair. They're celebrating. This is their, we've kind of realized this is their first official outing and like ass kicking uh, on the streets <laughs> after all their years of training and Splinter's trying to like keep their heads level and be like, were you seen? <laughs> Which we see Leo so often as the, not the stoic leader, but he's like the more responsible, mature one. And I like how he comes in with them too, like excited and joking about being on patrol for the first time. And then he has to immediately like revert back to kneeling in front of Splinter and being the only one that kind of calms down. Right. It's nice seeing Leo like that. Yes, yeah. Master Splinter. Yes, Master Splinter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Splinter's trying to like, you know, talk to them about their experience and just continue to, to teach and train them. And in the background, Michelangelo's ordering a pizza and just yelling, arguing. I know it is hard for you here. Good. Underground. Yeah, okay. I want a like large, you, thick crust with double cheese, ham, pepperoni. Your teenage Which mind. even here, I like how the the actor playing Mikey in the suit, as he's talking on the phone, just like casually swinging his nunchucks, like absentmindedly. <laughs> and then he's like pointing at the phone as he's having an argument <laughs> on it. All of these things really add to the fact that I can watch this as a kid. I can watch this now and I don't see 
foam and rubber suits, I just see like, oh yeah, it's it's Mikey. That's very Mikey. And I mean no anchovies. You put anchovies on this thing and you're in big trouble, okay? He orders the pizza and this is when Raf gets reprimanded for like losing the sigh and almost well, He's being not reprimanded. Found out. Like Raphael's just hot headed and like Spinner's like, let it go. Like <laughs> If it's gone, it's gone. I have a thousand other sighs, and it's just like a wall of them. <laughs> Please, Raphael, enough with the sighs. <laughs> um, it's not the sighs that matter. <laughs> <laughs> I made another funny. This sets up his whole character arc, too, through the movie. Because you can yeah. see that he's clearly upset that he lost it. So he decided to just leave and, you know, blow off the steam that was already well past accumulation. And we'll come back to it when uh, we get to the future scenes. But yes, he's, he's <laughs> definitely continued. really upset. I do like that um, Mikey's interrupting Splinter's lesson and Splinter just launches a book at it. <laughs> <laughs> um, they really, they do feel like a family in this movie. Yeah, the they feel one. like teenagers. Yeah. Here, like you said, like Leo's, yeah, he's the stoic leader, but he's also excited from this battle, and he's like doesn't feel like just a stuffy leader. Like Donnie and Mikey are the middle he's, children. Oh, he's getting caught up. Raph is like the the young hothead. Yeah, Donnie and Mikey are like definitely stick together through <laughs> the other parts of the Poor movie. Grime. Yeah, <laughs> they start dancing to uh, tequila. Well, this is like meditating. Uh, <laughs> Splinter does try to say some serious shit. He's like, you know, one day we'll be gone. You know, you're not going to have me forever, which is foreshadowing for his later capture. And a lot to drop Raph. on a kid in a kid's movie. <laughs> which, I mean, it's... Heavy lessons. Like Nick mentioned, like the whole overarching, the storyline of it, it's Splinter... Granted, preparing them to go on patrol, preparing them to, like, help the city, but preparing them for his own mortality, which is just, it's rough, but I mean, it's its a good lesson, I guess, to learn as a kid in the 90s. It's interesting watching Michelangelo disassociate from it, too. Every time he's presented with a real mature problem, he completely disconnects. And that's when he does something, like, in his typical LOL, Mikey, you so funny kind of... Uh, mentality and especially um, you know here he's ordering a pizza not wanting to focus in on you know some serious matter in a few minutes with the pizza scene Donnie asks him point blank completely ignores the question and there's yeah. a hit, like a deleted montage sequence and even like cut storyline of how distraught Mikey was losing Splinter. He took it the hardest out of the entire lot. He was really upset. And that's also why out of all the turtles that April draws, Mikey is the only one that's not present because she did draw a picture, but that picture relates too much to what was going on in his own head. And they just, since they cut out that whole bit, they had to lose the picture too. Yeah. I didn't know this until today when I was looking up things, you stole all of my talking points. I'm sorry. Um, that's okay. Yeah, I think there, there's a, you know, later on we'll get to it, but there's a scene yeah. where Micah comes in and jokes about the turtle wax and you see April and Casey are like really on edge because this is like, I, I think it was like the first time they'd seen him after he like blew up and like broke a punching bag and like broke a wall in the, in the garage, like out of frustration. Like they could see he was like depressed and like angry. Mm-hmm. And that like light that breaks the tension when he comes in and like makes that turtle wax joke. But so that, that has a different meaning, I guess, than it uh, originally was supposed to. Even when he's on the bar, or even at that scene when um, April's talking when they're in Connecticut and you hear Raphael scream out, you know, Splinter. That's actually Mikey that's screaming it. That's not Raph. Really? But they dubbed it with Raph's voice. But if you look, if you look close enough, that's Mikey that's screaming it because the Damn, orange in the really out. dark setting. And I think there's like enough of a blue filter that it it looked enough like it was red, so you would think it's him. And then hearing Raph's voice, you're like, oh, it's Raph. No, that's that's Mikey in that scene. Huh? Yeah, it makes sense that it 
they that it would be raf in this cut of the movie like that doesn't yeah that makes sense that it's him saying that screaming splinter yeah instead he's the one that took most of the uh the upset and distraught attention right. to the whole splinter getting kidnapped because otherwise i mean i thought it was raf wakes up everybody celebrates raf being awake and then he walks up to that roof and just screams <laughs> Raph is awake and his rage is back. <laughs> Redirect this anger. <laughs> um, so Raph, uh, Raph heads out. Uh, Mike and Donnie, <laughs> Donnie's skating around the uh, sewer, meets up with Mikey, who's waiting for a pizza that he just ordered. Uh, yeah, and Donnie's like... Hey, Mikey, did you ever think about what Splinter said tonight? I mean, about what it would be like. You know, not having him. And then Mikey just, it's like he didn't even say anything. It's like Pizza Dude's got 30 seconds, and that becomes another one of the <laughs> his quotable lines ever. 122, 122, <laughs> and an 8. Where the heck is 122 and an 8? You're standing on it, dude. The Domino's delivery man arrives. Um... And that's Michelin Sisti. That's Michelangelo's uh, suit actor. So that's his cameo. Oh, huh. pretty good cameo. In pure Turtles tradition, while watching this, I did manage to order Domino's. <laughs> <laughs> For just having a little bit part, getting to act outside of the suit, I think he did a funny job. Yeah. Yeah, he played it perfectly. I got to get a new route. And I thought I'd deliver it everywhere. Uh, side note that's funny. Domino's is the featured pizza in the movie, but Pizza Hut is the one that like spent the money like to on the campaign like after the fact on this movie. So that's I don't know if they gave the uh, Domino's the option and they're like nah. And Pizza Hut was like we'll do it, but it's just it's funny funny having the competitor be in the movie that you're hawking all over the place. I mean, it could have been a win win. Domino's figures like people are gonna watch the movie, see Domino's on screen, and be like, oh, I'll get Domino's. But then Pizza Hut figures people are going to see a Turtles movie and see pizza and just want pizza. So they'll follow yeah. our commercial. I'm sure they both benefited, yeah, benefited from this. I mean, who doesn't like pizza? Pizza. <laughs> pizza. 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 I love when the uh, the delivery driver is handing the pizza down to Mikey and he just gets a hand on it through the grate. And he's like, <laughs> give me that. <laughs> yeah, it's just like, <laughs> give me that. <laughs> I'm impatient. <laughs> it kills me a little bit to see the pizza go horse or ver- vertical. Yeah, what is this Kino? Uh, <laughs> I was saying that's what, that was, must be a callback from Kino. That's why they did that in the in the second just movie. Folds the box three times, sticks it in his back pocket, gets on a motorbike. Uh, yeah, like here's a, a pizza. Kills me. Well, wise man say forgiveness is divine, but never pay full price for a late pizza. Then we cut. And we see Raph is leaving none other than. The Critters movie. The Critters movie? The Critters. critters. No, that's not that's like Critters a cartoon. 5. The Critters movie. <laughs> I remember um, that movie coming out as a kid, and I was ter- too even scared to watch it, and I've always been wanting to see it just for the turtle reference. It, um, it doesn't great. look good. I'm, I'm not surprised. It's hokey fun. I mean, it's, as Raph said, you know, where do they come up with this? So... That was kind of the review I needed. I don't need Siskel and Niebuhr. Raph, what did you think of this? I'd watch that review show. Actually, yeah. Now I just want Raph walking out of a bunch of different movies. So is that top spinning forever or what? Two second, two second reviews. It's just whatever first comment he says as he walks out the theater. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Critters is one of those movies, those blockbuster VHS cover movies that I always am like, there's Critters, and I've never seen it. I'm just like, I always see it at the rental store. I think Critters 3 is uh, Leonardo DiCaprio's start. Well, that's the one I'll start with. As I begin my Leonardo DiCaprio retrospective that we're doing later in the year. (laughs) Yeah, so Ralph comes out of Critters. Uh, He's walking by Have you realized you've said Ralph every time throughout this episode? I don't say Ralph... It's like the fourth time you said Ralph. That is not. The, I do not say Ralph. You can Raph. cut. You can cut this whole thing out. I just wanted to let you know so you don't edit it later. Listen and be like, "Fuck!" I said. Dean, Ralph did you know that times. one? Of, did you know the one of the main characters 
of a childhood inspirational thing that you've loved all of your life. You know, you've misset it the last 12 times. <laughs> I believe that you were saying Raph. <laughs> Tim, Tim's mad because when he writes Raph, it autocorrects to Ralph. And that's what he's, he's projecting. <laughs> um. When I did the text to speech, not to digress, but at one point I referenced, um, the Fast and the Furious with Shredder stealing all the equipment. But instead of it saying Dom Toretto, it said like Dom Tourette's instead. <laughs> That's my TED talk. <laughs> <Dom Tourette's. laughs> uh, so Raph is walking out of the theater. He walks by two hood- young hoodlums who snatch an old lady's purse. Uh, they run by Raph unknowingly. And he trips them. He just sticks his leg out like a cartoon. Like, they uh, snatches the purse and just you see a shot of the lady catching the purse that Raph has thrown back to her and he walks up to the thugs and like pulls up back his coat to show the sigh he's like I'm packing boys <laughs> like, get the <laughs> hell out of here um, although in the up. 90s did anybody really know what a sigh was until Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles when no, he just flashed yeah, they're what? like what <laughs> Looking at a two on his belt, it really just looked like he had a metal rod. If anything, it probably felt like, is that a cop in a nightstick? <laughs> is that a really big green cop? Is that a punker with green makeup? I was just about to say, is that a punker? <laughs> I hate punkers. What is punking rod? Um, <laughs> it kind of made me laugh too, watching Casey Jones take on the, the muggers at first. Because he really was about to beat the absolutely loving shit out of those two guys. He hit them in the face with a wooden <laughs> hockey stick. Like, <laughs> full strength, they too. Were, they were getting, like, Batman treatment. Like, <laughs> they were going, about to be, anyway. However many teeth they started with, they certainly have less walking away. Now that was a crime, you purse-scrubbing pukes. And this is uh, the penalty. <laughs> you just see the spatter on his mask. <laughs> yeah, really. There probably should have been. And that's when Raph comes in takes Casey out. He's like, chill, bro. How about a five-minute game misconduct for roughing, pal? It's interesting to see Raph, who is up until this point just a ball of rage and anger, and then stopping Casey Jones and then telling him, like, because Casey talks about how they need to be taught a lesson. He's like, not like that. They don't. Not from you. Yeah, so instead uh, instead of using, like, you know, a hockey stick, let me use a two large metal size and <laughs> obliterate them. You were going to leave them alive, Casey. I'm going to stab them through the heart. Casey Jones uh, is a half measure. His brother's walking around with two fucking katanas. Like, what are you going to do with that in a fist fight, huh? <laughs> so Raph insults Casey's baseball bat. A Jose can say go bat. Tell me. You didn't pay money for this. Ooh. I don't know enough about baseball history, but Canseco was a Yankee, right? I think he had... Um, was he n- He kind of went crazy. <laughs> I think if I, I just, remember right, I could be completely they were wrong. At the height, he was at like the height of his power in like the late 80s. I was this, like Canseco. Was, that was part of a, the steroids thing, right? I don't, I don't remember. I think something like he got a lot of negative bad press for like... Doing something bad. And wait, rage. yeah the the Lonely Island joke thing. The Bash Brothers. Yeah. He's right. Jose Canseco. Yeah. When Raph says, "Tell me you didn't pay money for this Jose Canseco bet," like it's funny, but I don't know why it's funny. But it, it, it I just know that it's funny. I would just know if you guys had any. I think as a child, I just laughed that. because I knew it was a dig on him, but I had no <laughs> idea. Because I never followed baseball. <laughs> I did, and I didn't even know. Just because they're in New York, I'm like, isn't he a Yankees fan? Maybe he's a Mets fan. Dear listener, I just wanted to chime in and say while editing this that Jose Canseco was on the Oakland Athletics and I suppose a rival of the Yankees. And of course, Raphael will make fun of him. So Raph gets the upper hand on Casey at first, knocks him down with his baseball bat, but. Uh, then Raph is introduced to Cricket. Uh, <laughs> Casey pulls a Cricket bat out. Cricket? Cricket? Nobody understands Cricket. You gotta know what a crumpet is to understand Cricket. I'll teach you. I didn't understand that scene. 
What do you mean? Well, you need to know what a crumpet is to understand cricket. <laughs> it's a crumpet is British like a cake, I think. So I think he's saying that it's a British sport. So he's like, nobody knows what cricket is. You got to be British to understand cricket is what he's saying. Man, way to make me feel like I struck out on my own joke. <laughs> Did he use a host I can say, go back? Whiffer. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I don't, sorry, I explained it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that went over my head. Casey calls him a freak as he runs away, and Raph is pissed about that. Chases him and then gets hit by a cab. <laughs> he rolls over the hood. And that's where you get Josh Pay's on screen uh, cameo. What the heck was that? Looked like sort of a big title in a trench coat. Raphael just hit Raphael. Raphael? Raphael just hit Raphael in the cab. You're in your own head now, What the hell was that? <laughs> I blame you, Tim. Come back here! I'm not finished with you! Damn! Raph screaming like that. Every time Raph screams out of pure frustration, anger, sadness, whatever, it always freaked me out as a kid. It always gave me the anxiety that I don't know if I want to keep watching this. And then the scene ends and then it's Mikey doing something funny. It's It hits like a weird... <laughs> tone in his voice when he does it that it's like it sounds angry or like it sounds like somewhere between he's angry and also he's like confused and upset every time like when he does the yeah, I'm not it's... finished with you damn it's he sounds frustrated like I just yeah. wanted to get out here and beat something tonight and now I look like a chump I feel this movie's Raph's movie yeah even though it gets taken out for a part of it it's he has the most arc yeah, yeah, I feel like a majority of, of all of the the story moving and progressing along is Raph as the catalyst. Uh -huh. It's probably why they removed the Mikey stuff. Which I would have liked to keep that in just because they all have some time in this, but I think Mikey could have used more time rather than just as comic, comic relief. relief. Yeah, from, I mean, the movie's... From beginning to start of the credits, it's only 90 minutes long, so it's not like it's overstaying its welcome. We could have had it, probably put a few more beats back in. So we cut from Raph losing Casey on the foot race, and he's, he's sneaking into the lair late at night, where it's like it's like the old, it's like the parents stayed up late to like <laughs> catch the kid coming in. Splinter's there, lights up a candle. Papa, yes. Come sit by me. Couldn't this wait till morning? You will listen now. Raphael doesn't really say anything. Like, you can just tell that it's like it is affecting him. You know, like he realizes what Splinter is trying to get across to him. No, he doesn't. First thing he does the next morning is he gets his coat on and then he goes <laughs> off to find his sigh. Well, he goes to find his sigh, but I think what he's talking about with the anger does resonate. No, I didn't get that vibe. I got the complete opposite. He was just completely um, ignoring it. What? Yeah. It comes into play when um, I'll explain the whole thing because I don't want to keep jumping ahead. But like I, I plotted out his whole <laughs> character arc in my notes. So there's a key point later on when that's when he fully realizes he fucked up. You kind of see like all the stages of uh, grief go throughout this whole movie. So this is his um, point of denial because, I mean, Splinter literally just tells him right now, like, stop focusing that anger inside, you know, focus it out and don't forget about your brother. So what does he do? He goes on a solo mission and he doesn't tell anybody what happens either. Fine. <laughs> I still disagree with you. Um, <laughs> I just want to point out Splinter's fish hand here when he reaches to touch uh, Raphael's head. <laughs> just, were, it's kind of you the, just <laughs> there were some scenes in this that like i i'm i'm complimenting the movie constantly like it all holds mm. up except for a couple of things and every time splitters on scene like don't don't do anything with your hands please please <laughs> he just goes to like touch Raphael's forehead like lovingly and he just kind of just like lays his hand <laughs> on top of his head <laughs> You just see it like off camera, just like slapping around. 
Ow, Splinty is scratching my eyes. <laughs> um, uh, we cut to the next morning and April's boss, Charles Pennington, has come to her apartment. I guess hearing that she was jumped uh, by Sam Rockwell and other thugs. I thought this uh, whole thing was grossly inappropriate and misconduct for a boss to visit his employee's apartment, especially while she's getting ready for work. I forgot it was her boss and I thought they were dating. And then I was yeah. like, are they dating? This is really weird for him to just like show up with his kid and like, dude, it's while even she's worse. trying to get ready. And then I realized, it's, oh no, it's I her boss. It that Wait, that's worse. <laughs> yeah. It's, dude, it's worse when she, he comes back later when the turtles are still there. She's like, oh, can you get me a towel? He's in her bathroom going through like her tub and shit. It's just so, <laughs> so weird. Yeah, he follows her into the bathroom. I mean, yeah. yeah plus, he shows up with I his never, son and then Danny like <laughs> steals money from her while they're there and then they leave. Yeah. He boosts 20 from her uh, pocketbook. It's like, I don't want my boss like showing up to my house and going through my stuff, much less my boss showing up with their kid and then my kid going through my stuff. You could have just ended it. I don't want my boss showing up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this scene pretty much just sets up, okay, he's her boss and Danny steals from her, which which sets up part of his own arc for later on. And then we get out to maybe later that day. April is interviewing Chief Stearns at City Hall or police station or wherever. It looks, more like, it looks more like City Hall when she comes out of it later. It's the cleanest um, building in this whole movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> She's given the hardball questions of Chief Stearns and he's visibly pissed. Uh, we see, we catch a glimpse of Dr. Claw <laughs> watching. <laughs> <laughs> we cut and we see Shredder is like watching many of these stolen televisions uh, back at the warehouse. This is our first glimpse of Shredder and just kind of darkly lit. We see kind of the outline of his helmet he's watching april she's talking about the foot and asking questions and he's like silence her please which throws a knife at the screen he barks fast because if this was live it took him like 20 minutes to get guys down there yeah it's like after the they interview have, on the way back the traffic yeah oh it has one of uh, <laughs> our favorite lines in this in this whole scene too also i think we discussed it during the teenage mutant Ninja turtles 2 episode but it makes so much sense if Chief Stearns is on the take or involved somehow. Oh, he absolutely was. Because it's like he's clearly not doing his job. He's clearly not interested in stopping the crime wave other than talking about it. And he seems to be taking a very light hand with all of the stuff that's been going on. We need no, more he, April O'Neils to hold him responsible. Yeah, no, he absolutely wasn't on it because he threatened... There, there's no other reason why he would threaten um, uh, Charles with his son to like, you need to I, get April to stop or, you know, fire her and we'll release your son. It just doesn't seem like enough for something as if it really was like low level, like no one gives a shit. He wouldn't threaten to fire somebody over something like that. You know, I, I think it's just because she's making him look like a fool and he's like, tell her to piss off. Mm. I don't, yeah, I didn't think he really had any connection to anything. So the best way to stop a reporter from making you look like a fool is to blackmail their boss to have you fired. <laughs> he obviously has no control over April anyway. <laughs> yeah. And you mean to tell me um, that she wouldn't then end up at another station with this brand new hot story of how the Chief Stearns blackmailed a news manager to, uh, shut down a case we we see that set up for danny in this scene like he's being arrested. He was arrested and being brought into the station but april never saw him but we as the audience see he's arrested and that's set up for later um before we move on just a quick call back to uh our tropes episode they throw the line in english please during the uh <laughs> questioning i'm not sure i understood all that chief stearns would you mind repeating it in English, perhaps. April uh, gets called into Chief Stern's office after the interview, gets reamed out by him. I like how she's like, time me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to her, like, the the intern guy that's, you know, working yeah. the, with the equipment. The cameraman. Yeah, it's her burn. 
Um, what she comes out after getting yelled at, he's like, a minute 30, a new record. Uh, she comes out down the stairs of the uh, police station and we see Raph is there. <laughs> in broad daylight in his, in his uh, disguise, I don't know if that is much as believable i mean he just looks like even a though punker. he's wearing a trench coat and a hat i mean um, his trench coat and hat is very like in the the old fantastic four comics the thing would just wear a trench coat and a hat when he would go out places nobody will bother me then yeah it's very inconspicuous i like he he like you see him smile like at the very end as he's turning like you see his like dimples come up he's like <laughs> i don't know what's going through his head he's like oh yeah i found her or but i guess Probably. the report kind of gave it you away you know i finally get was. critters now <laughs> it's an okay movie <laughs> i see the appeal uh april goes down to the subway where she is immediately accosted by a group of foot that shredder has just sent that have been um, waiting for her we've been waiting for you miss O'Neill. what am i behind on my sony payments again <laughs> Your mouth may yet bring you much trouble, Miss O'Neill. I deliver a message. <laughs> Shut it. Uh, it's pretty brutal. Like he, the way he just sticks his hand out and slaps her in the face. <laughs> I mean, it's it's terrible, but it's just amusing. The the whole like your mouth may bring you much trouble. We bring yeah. you a message. Shut it. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's well written like that's like perfect i mean it's like what do the five fingers say to the face <laughs> she gets slapped and then immediately is like okay like she's ready to throw down she has been carrying raft's side with her we find out she pulls it out is wielding it they knock it out of her hands pretty quickly and then she starts peeing them with her purse which yeah i love how she doesn't panic or run it's just like i'm gonna arm myself with a weapon you take that weapon i arm myself with another weapon She's like, this is not even the worst thing that happened to me in the subway. <laughs> um, she gets knocked out, but we see Raph reach around the pillar and grab his sigh. And with fury comes around the pillar and just launches into the foot and just kicks their asses pretty easily. I love that, like, scream with the, f yeah, with the, the, the yeah. shaky cam as he's screaming, running out after them. Yeah! I want to... POV shot of the Foot Clan seeing that, and then just all of them just <laughs> oh shit! <laughs> Is that a turtle? <laughs> Watch out! He has two sides. It's a punker <laughs> with his punking rod. <laughs> <laughs> Is he a green cop? <laughs> Raph quickly just grabs April, carries her, waits for the tr a train to pass, and just takes her down the subway tunnel. <laughs> he jumps in front of it. <laughs> You'll never take didn't me. Time that great. <laughs> <laughs> if I can't ever, nobody can. Yeah, with all his, his training, I'm really surprised he didn't be a little more careful running back because it's not like he was that inconspicuous running down the track because it was pretty obvious. Right. Well, I feel like also it's they've had a ton of training, but if they've only started going on patrol like a night before he probably doesn't have a lot of practical application especially with a, a knocked out civilian that he's carrying around well no that was but, part of their training splinter would just <laughs> knock out a new york <laughs> subway ongoer now get back to the temple <laughs> or sewer uh Raphael arrives back in the lair with April. <laughs> like he's like, can we keep her? <laughs> Splinter. <laughs> I love how like Splinter reads the situation and realizes, you know, this woman's seriously hurt. And he's like, you know, <clears throat> Michelangelo, get towel. And then like Leo, get pillow. <laughs> and then Mikey's just like, yes. <laughs> um, I love her reaction to seeing when she opens her eyes and S S Splinter's just standing over her, staring at her like that terror and that scream and seeing the turtles like, yeah, that's how somebody should react to like inhuman mutant strange things like in front of I you. I love their reaction to her reaction, though, because she starts <laughs> yeah. screaming, then they start screaming. And then I think it's like Mikey <laughs> yeah. or Donnie. They like put their hand over <laughs> <Yeah>. their heart. <laughs> Um, 
I love her line of why did I ever dream of Harrison Ford? Yeah, it almost seems like <laughs> improv because he she interrupts Splinter when she says that. Like it seems like an improv line, and he like sighs like a, a heavy sigh like. That he got Me too. Um. <laughs> I just love that Splinter knows who Harrison Ford is. <laughs> he's so well like he has so much wisdom and he's so reserved and he's able to give these amazing suggestions but deep down he's, he's a movie buff he does like that Cagney line <laughs> he had to pass he had to pass the time somehow raising those kids um, L- Splinter launches into the turtles origin story here uh, at least just the origin of how they mutated which was apparently shot, and it looks like it now seeing it, but shot on eight millimeter, so as to feel like a home movie, okay. like an old. I was gonna movie. say, like it, it has a different feel to the whole thing, and I like how they do the same thing again later of just very simple right. scenes against that black backdrop during the narration. Yeah, the just, lighting gag. Yeah, yeah it works. Um, but that grittiness, I was like, oh, yeah, okay. It's literally, it's shot on 8 millimeter. That's why it feels so Yeah, like a snuff film. As well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, puppet, the puppetry here is kind of funny. Um, I mean, it works, but it's also like... The tiny it's turtles a little goofy. look pretty impressive. Yeah. Yeah, Splinter, Splinter looks maybe a little less so. But, um, yeah, so we realize, you know, the whole origin of the ooze and... That's why they transformed. Between this versus the cartoon, I actually like this version better. It's practically the same thing. It's just I like the concept that Splinter is a rat and he's not a human that turned into a rat. Yeah. Yeah. It makes more that sense. Was a liberty, that was a liberty the cartoon took from the comic. This origin is more what the comic was. Yeah. I mean, this is like cool and fun of, oh, he became sentient and turned from a rat. The other one sounds like body horror. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, I was a normal man with a job and a life. And then I got mutated into a rat and now I live in a sewer. I think he was living in the sewer at the time of the uh, <laughs> oh, well, transformation. Move it on up. <laughs> yeah. Um, pizza. 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 Radical, radical, radical. <laughs> they escort her home i like their walk through the sewers are you guys sure you know where you're going 11th and bleaker nope this is only ninth street <laughs> they get out at her place and she's like all i have to offer you is frozen pizza let's go for it you said the magic word you guys eat pizza doesn't, doesn't everybody, everybody? <laughs> this shot always kind of weirded me out <laughs> I, yeah <laughs> Like, I stopped and played it back to laugh. Yeah, it's like, it's clearly shot in reverse and then reverse to get, or like, you know, they, they reverse the footage to make it look like he's springing up from the the thing, but it's so jarring think, to see. I think they just like, they like played it in fast, they recorded it in low frames or just played it fast. Yeah. Again, it's like played in fast motion. I have to wonder, like, was it Donnie launching him up out of the... <laughs> <laughs> Go get it! <laughs> they cut, they're up at the... Her apartment just palling around. Mikey's doing movie star and person celebrity impersonations. Uh, yo, uh, well, uh, maybe I'll fight Apollo, and uh, maybe I won't. You know, <laughs> what do you think, Adrian? April clicked with these guys real quick. She did right away. It was like I'm panicked. You explain your situation. You helped me. You know what? Okay, you're pretty cool. It kind of makes sense without again like. Yeah, she was like immediately defending herself against the foot. She just like, she just rolls, plays it. it how it comes. She's like, yeah, exactly. She's a real New Yorker. I mean, I would, I'd imagine I'd react the same way if I found sentient mutant animals and they were nice. Well, now here's the thing. I'm like, I'm having a great time. I mean, she is a New Yorker, so it's just like, eh. <laughs> yeah. Now the question she is, would you feel comfortable if that were to happen, Dean? Because you already have experience with the Teen Mutant Ninja Turtles as a concept. But in their universe, I don't think they have any equivalent. It's not like the power pachyderms. Objectively, her arc, her mini arc there to hanging out with them, it's like she freaked out. She thought she was like dead or dying or going to die. But then they talked to her and were intelligent and were like, let's take you home. It's fine. They drank Pepsi with her. 
and apple juice and ate pizza. I think I could get into it. Just before they all left, the only catch is, is um, while they were, you know, tending to April in the turtle lair, one of the foot soldiers did follow Raph. And here we see him kind of peek through the door frame to see everything that's going on. He, in the sewer lair, yes. Yeah. That's where he was peeking. Yeah. yeah. Just little little setup for what's about to happen. The so turtles leave April and head back to the lair, and there's this wide shot of their door, their front door, and it's just totally smashed in. And we know it, but they they don't see it yet. And they, when Leo sees it, they like all kind of get ready. He whips out his, they all whip out their weapons. They're getting ready to fight. Uh, they rush in and see the place is trashed, and Splinter is obviously nowhere to be found. I I love how Raf comes in, just like pushes his way to the front. Like, what the fuck? I love this shot. Yeah, it really. This is where I felt the movie shined, and like, this isn't just a comic book movie. Like, this is a well shot movie. Because if you took out the outlandish turtles thing and you applied it to like it's just a drama, this was beautifully done. So, like, the specific storytelling and the camera shot where the turtles come back, they see Splinter's gone. Um, you know, Raphael bursts in. He's already upset. And when you see him raise both of his arms screaming, this is the first time that you see him holding both of his sides. So you see the connection that he finally realized, like, this thing that I've been trying to get this whole time, it, it resulted in all of this. <laughs> And I felt a lot of the screaming that was done was to exemplify that because obviously he reclaimed it. And now showing that, you know, this hyper fixation of getting it back, being the cause of all this is really just like the, the final tip to push him over and how furious he gets. Not at, you know, instead of being upset, like, oh, no, Splinter's gone. He just gets mad at himself. And that con constant anger that he's fueling is just it's. He's reaching that boiling point. I think you're reading too much into this. I think he just stepped on like a broken piece of glass. You know, Mikey's Legos. <laughs> I think that's that's a good take as far as Raph is searching for both halves of his like his size. Just to, Raph is looking to be whole and he's finally whole again. And now he's not because now Splinter's gone. And he was the cause of it. I never really looked at how like, yeah, it was Raph's direct stubbornness that led to splinter's capture Although, and then all the times too of splinter constantly telling him like just let it go does he let it go in the end does he let it go i don't know no that's his toxic trait he never he never <laughs> no casey jones does <laughs> um so yeah that great shot of raf screaming leads into uh just cuts a, a shot of <laughs> chief's turn is late at the office we realize he's calling Charles to bribe him, like tell April to back off the case. Cause he's like, do you have a son named Danny? And we realize, kind of in the next scene that he's offered to let Danny off the hook. As long as April stops. Did you have a son asking, named Danny? Making him. Did? <laughs> <laughs> he's in about 15 pieces in the morgue. Jesus Christ. <laughs> um, so my boy, Johnny golf balls. <laughs> and then we cut and see that the turtles have arrived at april's apartment and they are pretty depressed that splinter's gone splinter um splinter <laughs> splinter that's one that lip movement there is one of the couple in the movie that i'm like it looks a little funky but we cut to the next day the turtles have obviously spent the night there and charles is busting in just to tell april to drop the foot clan case all the turtles scramble to hide. They they do a decent job. This was impressive that it's like he goes to check in the shower and he pulls the curtain back and he's gone and he's hiding like up on the ceiling. Good for him to go from, you know, flat footed to clinging the ceiling in the span of half a second. Yeah. And then Mikey doing the same thing, being pretty much caught white in the open under a table. <laughs> And then in a split See, second, the, he's I, just, I have to say, I guess that was a pretty terrible hiding spot. Um, but <laughs> he opens a curtain. The second and... hiding spot after that. Why didn't he do that first? Whatever he, wherever he disappeared to. 
he opens the curtain and Donnie's standing right there and it's sorry Charles you shouldn't have opened the curtain <laughs> bow staff right to the the turtles neck. all slowly Go start on. like moving into the room <laughs> April you don't want to see this they're playing like spin that wheel as they just all get after him spin April that realizes wheel. what she's gotten into when they just murder slaughter Charles <laughs> and Danny we're sorry April the streets will run red until Splinter's back <laughs> Sorry, April. I mean, come on. No witnesses. <laughs> it's like the movie Critters. April's obviously pissed and doesn't want to get off of this story. But they eventually leave and Mikey pops up. That was close. Whoa. Time to switch to decaf, April. Danny and his dad are driving. Charles, his dad, is on his ass for being arrested and stealing. And... Once they get to a stoplight or in traffic, Danny bolts for the subway. Told you how many times we need locking mechanisms on the vehicle doors. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it, Danny. I mean, imagine if how the entire movie would have been different if Danny goes to run and his father just grabs his jacket and he's like, stay in the car. Wouldn't have ratted out Splinter. Wouldn't have had the raid on the sewer. None of that would have progressed. Listen, if... If Orokusaki never killed Hamato Yoshi, none of this would have happened. You know what? If the Big Bang didn't... <laughs> I could do this all day. So they end um, up in the world's coolest kid hangout. Yeah. Cigarettes, beer. Regular and menthol. Probably nudie mags. I mean, there's got to be Playboys in there, right? No. Shredder takes a hard stance on pornography. You think that kid was smoking a fake cigarette? That wasn't a cigarette, dude. That was a cigar. It's a, I, I, yeah, you're right. Cigar. <laughs> was it a real cigar? That's why I was wondering, because it's like, it's this huge stogie. Well, it was probably the herbal kind, but still, I mean, it's impressive that they even showed child smoking. They even had child drinking, too, but I think they were pushing it with the smoking and they just had crushed beer cans throughout the whole thing. I mean, it's funny because you see pallets of like Pepsi and Sprite and all these different soda products all over the place. But the cans that you see that the kids would be drinking directly in front of them are all like they look like beer cans to me. I couldn't place what it was, but they I know for a fact they were not uh, drinking you know, Yoohoo or Pepsi as all the cans showed around them. Pepsi and old Milwaukee. Uh -huh. The best mixer. <laughs> um, what chases what? <laughs> new Pepsi. <laughs> or, uh, Crystal Pepsi, new Coke. We're introduced to Tatsu here, Shredder's right-hand man. He's walking around. He has... his. This line's probably... Something like one of the most quoted things, I guess, in my daily life. One of the kids bumps into him and the kid's like, oh, shit. And Toss is just like, go play. And like, so I like how they have a skate park, an arcade, a fighting ring, infinite soda everywhere. This looks like a Boston startup. I would work there now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is. The offices are on like the set, the third floor. Like this is just like the modern day startup. Yeah, like we're cool. Like <laughs> if you're not feeling like working, just go down and you know fight each other. Tatsu is here to empower you to be the best employee you can. <laughs> <laughs> I just want a shirt of Tatsu's face, and it's just go play like a thumbs up <laughs> with like a smirk or just a no. I guess a frown, like a full just on a smile. On <laughs> <laughs> Two exclamation points. You think Shredder designed this place? Like they had like a interior design meeting. <laughs> he sat down with a contractor. <laughs> I want to know what his end game is just to sell like home stereo equipment. I don't get it. I guess that funds their activities. Uh, but I, I mean, mean, to do so what? They're, yeah, they're to essentially what? They're just thieves? They're, they to steal take over the city somehow. They steal stereos so they can get the resources to steal more stereos, just so they could steal more stereos. Did did Shredder move to New York City and get caught up in some sort of pyramid scheme? That there was some other crime <laughs> boss that was like, "So what you do is you get all these kids together and you steal stereos, 
And then those kids will find more kids and they'll steal stereos. And they tell two friends and they tell their friends and so on. And so on, and so on. Everything's made in Japan, so I figured, well, maybe if I steal them at the imported cost instead of the factory cost, I might make it, I might actually make some money <laughs> off of this. The important thing is I'm my own boss. <laughs> <laughs> I did like how Tatsu beat a kid to teach him a lesson to never lower his eyes to the enemy, which, not a bad lesson, and the kid seemed to, like, appreciate it and wasn't injured, so it's... Okay, yeah, he took a, that shot to the head, though, was looked pretty severe. What if this was in the same universe as Fast and the Furious? <laughs> and Go after on. losing after losing Shredder, he was so hung up on losing family because he was the guy that said, hey, man, this family here. What if that was <laughs> Dom Toretto? Because <laughs> years later, he just uses cars instead of street ninja skills to steal the same equipment. Until his like you know early to mid twenties, <laughs> I, I mean, can see it. Also, uh, Dominic Toretto does have street ninja skills. <laughs> I've seen him jump yeah, see out that? of a car, grab somebody, and land on like a tank or whatever. He also like with his stomp took out a parking structure. I think <laughs> there's a gong sounds, and everybody is called to this kind of like. Meeting yeah, hall. It's the annual keynote. <laughs> Shredder shows up like he's a CEO. <laughs> this year's speaker will be a Rokusaki. To build better synergy. <laughs> <laughs> this year's motto is the power of you. <laughs> this is where one of the few deleted scenes are, too. So I guess in uh, anger of. Oh, right. Losing April the first time. He sat on the ground and had the failed foot soldiers that returned try and attack him to kind of like reclaim their honor. And while sitting the whole time, he's able to do like one on four and not even break a sweat. Right. And then the only one that, that managed to survive was the one that was given back, I think, the um, bandana. The full scene, I don't think, even has been released yet. You can only see it through clips from documentaries. Yeah, I've seen a photo or something of Shredder sitting in that hall with the foot around him. Yeah. Um, but he has a badass entrance here. Hell yeah. With the lighting, like his shadow just on the floor from that big backlight. I think that's where some of my love for villains come from. Because when you grow up seeing badass characters like this, it sets an impression on a young child's mind. Well, I like how for a villain in a kid's movie, they never treat Shredder as a joke at any point. Like, I feel yeah, like no. nowadays they need he's to ease dangerous. the tension and be like, oh, he's the villain. And then always have like, <laughs> like Surf Ninjas, it's Leslie Nielsen with a phone sidekick. gag. Like, yeah, there needs to be some <laughs> foil to him. But this, it's just, nope, Tatsu is pretty serious. Shredder is serious as a heart attack. They will kill you given the chance. They will kill you not given the chance. But yeah, he's wearing this... Very shiny, metallic-looking, tiger-striped-ish cape. And the lights are glistening off his the, the crown on his helmet with the blades. He looks very scary. Intimidating, rather. At this point, since he just operates out of the shadows, it's like, who is he dressing for? Just to intimidate and like look powerful for his guys? It did make me laugh I later mean, on guess. in the movie where he's just kind of walking around talking to the guys. And it's just, why are you dressed up? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I get it. You're like the evil supervillain here, but out of context in the real world, it's just, why Why are you wearing that? Because it's the best villain outfit of all time. Hell it yes. Is. Sound off in the comments if we, <laughs> if we have comments. So Shredder starts off by, in this cut, just seems like he's anointing a new Foot Clan member. The hoodlums have gathered and he's telling them like, I this is your am family. your father. I'm your father. Like, I want you all to become full foot well, clan members. Yeah, like, I like how he, I, you can definitely understand and see why all these kids would join the foot clan. I mean, other than the perks, because the hideout. But one, it's a gang. All of and these like disenfranchised cool. kids of the late 80s, early 90s. And then you have Shredder referring to himself as like the father of these kids. He's a reassuring and supportive boss. 
I mean, he says things like during this of money cannot buy the honor which you have earned tonight. You make us all proud. If that was said by anyone else, that would be heartwarming. <laughs> With a different vocal timbre. Yeah. I mean, he's also holding Splinter captive, so loses points there. It would be really cool if that was a shared line that they both knew um, Yamato Yoshi said. And it would have been cool if both Splinter and Shredder said that same line, but because who's saying it, it has ultimately different meanings behind it. Right, yeah. like, since they both had the ta- the same teacher, essentially. Yeah, I mean, that that would be Roku great of Splinter saying that to them when they returned back from their first patrol. Yeah, because that is something I can definitely hear Splinter saying. But they don't know the concept of money. They just find everything in the trash. So. <laughs> they know Cagney. <laughs> um, yeah, we see during the speech that Splinter is chained up nearby. Uh, and that he's been captured. He's still alive. He's just captured. Although I feel like he looks so pitiful. Like, just he looks like he's in pain. And it obviously can't be fun to be forced to stand. I did like how through the course of the movie, too, you see him getting progressively worse. You never see yeah. that he's ex- like he's actually tortured or beat up. But just over the course, like in the beginning, he looks like he's just roughed up. He's had a bad night. And then you see him slowly getting more and more disheveled and bloodied even. Yeah. More of that show don't tell. He's glistening. He's sweating and he's bleeding. Yep. So Shredder kind of alludes to... Together we will punish these creatures. These... Turtles. Danny comes forward and we don't hear what he says, but we assume he's... Uh, A schmuck. Ratting out the turtles. We cut from there right to April's on TV. And she has not pulled the plug on her story. She's still talking about it. Um, talking about the foot and like that the police suck and Chief immediately calls and you'll start yelling. He just holds the phone up and you just hear Chief Stearns yelling. <laughs> at, Even aside from the Chief Stearns bit, like she's on TV and then she talks about being rescued and all of that. And it's like the first time in a movie where it, Instead of just saying the actual truth and sounding crazy, somebody alters the story like we've been asking for. It's, yeah, I was saved (laughs) by some of the citizens of New York that came to help me. And I want to thank Raphael. And it's, okay, you trim it down so it actually sounds believable. (laughs) So people don't think, oh, she's crazy. I was saved by a big green (laughs) tooth. I mean. Punker. It's just immediately like. Cuts to, we're having technical difficulties. <laughs> we'll be right back. Do, 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 well, I like how they're like, she's a good reporter. She's, she's a, a babe. babe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think lots of the comic relief, the lines work here. Throughout the movie, I mean. The turtles are watching her report at home from her apartment. When she thanks Raphael, I love when they gang up on him. He's like, <laughs> you're blushing. Hey, look. I think he's blushing. (laughs) I am not. I think he's actually turning red. Uh, hmm, maybe not. Throwing the sigh between his legs is also (laughs) hilarious. (laughs) (laughs) It looks good, too. I think they might have just had it on, like, a fishing line or something, because it, it, the actual sigh goes between his legs. Like, it's... I believe they actually threw it. Like, uh... (laughs) The accidental knife throw in Lord of the Rings and Vigo manages to deflect it with a sword. I think oh, yeah. I think uh, Raphael actually threw the sigh and it landed between Donnie's <laughs> legs. Something I just thought of, if Vigo actually deflected a knife, so they were actually throwing a knife at him or like it, something metal? It, it, the, the actor throwing the knife messed up, but Vigo was <laughs> able to deflect it like the boss that Holy he is. Holy shit. I, didn't, I just thought about that for the first time. I'm like, yeah, if he hit something, that means it was something was thrown at him. Yeah. Well, Peter That's Jackson amazing. used to throw knives at cast members during filming to keep them in character. Yeah, like during stressful moments yeah. that he wanted the performance to be like somebody throwing a knife at me. Like, that's what he wanted. Faster. More intense. <laughs> <laughs> Happier throws a knife. This is the scene when we're all getting the fellowship together. He's just chucking knives. 
offer your axe faster. Uh, my axe. <laughs> <laughs> more tender and loving throws a knife Ugh. so the report ends and I forget what leads them Raph and uh, Leo Raph wants to go out and like look for Splinter but Leo's like hold the phone we gotta assess the situation I don't remember do you yeah, remember what they're Raph, writing about Raph wanted to go out and to get find out him there. and Leo was yeah. of the other saying like April's putting the feelers out she's trying to find like right. getting a, a fix on his location and Raph was making fun of him for like, oh, our fearless right. leader. Yeah. Let's sit around. Oh, great leader. This is the... I never said I was a great leader. This is the bargaining stage of his five stages of denial. Or <sighs> grief, rather. So he's bargaining. He wants to just be able to go out and do it himself and like, we can do it. We can find him. Let's go. But Leo ain't having any of that shit. Fight, fight. Kitchen? Kitchen. <laughs> Pork rind. Pork, Pork rind. The animatronics on Leo's line as a uh, rap leaves was a little dodgy, but only one of a couple moments. He looks just dead in the camera. His lips don't move and you just hear it. Well, that's pretty much what happens. Oh, was that an inner thought? One side just droops like he's having a stroke. <laughs> just <laughs> falls down. Um, Raf, do you smell bread? <laughs> Good God. Leo, are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's because we only eat pizza every day. <laughs> Boys, your cholesterol is <laughs> through the roof. Um, <laughs> Raph goes up to the roof and uh, to blow off some steam, do some ninja moves <laughs> practice some martial arts casey happens to be a couple blocks over on the roof listen trying to get his am fm radio to work and uh he just glances over and notices raf in the distance so that just kind of sets up his appearance later but he sees raf uh just from across the building doing his like footloose routine <laughs> <laughs> yeah. just dancing it out heaven helps the raf uh, the foot, I guess, yeah, on the intel of Danny, know where April lives and that the turtles are probably here. So the, that's why the foot had descended upon this building and sneaking up on Raph. It's intercut with April getting back and showing the rest of the turtles the uh, antique shop. I love Raph, like, starts out pretty well <laughs> fighting the the foot on the roof. I mean, come on, how do you guys expect to beat me? <laughs> and they're like 50. <laughs> yeah. Good, Good answer. answer. Good answer. They pretty much start to kick his ass. Well, I like how as he's getting beaten up, they keep cutting back to them. And then April keeps mentioning like, where's, should we check on Raph? And they're like, eh, yeah. he does this. He'll be fine. It's like they're all screwball <laughs> from legend. Should, yeah. should we help him? Nah, he does this. Meanwhile, they're pulling him apart like a wishbone upstairs. <laughs> um, he loses his size again. Where did they get? Oh, I just had I just had a refrigerator question because there's a shot of the foot tossing Raph's size like yeah. away. He reclaims him later, but he doesn't expl show or explain how. Right. Just when the roof collapsed, um, when the roof collapsed, I guess that happened several times, and just they happened to land right next to him. I mean, they throw him through a plate, uh, a sky view uh, window. I don't know. <laughs> you see them drop him through the window, and then a second later, you see them drop two sides down. Well, he spent already a quarter of the movie getting one of them back. We weren't going to spend the rest to get all of them back. <laughs> Once again, Raph retrieves his size. <laughs> he has them attached to his wrists like Wiimotes. <laughs> Raph gets knocked unconscious. As April and the turtles come back up to the apartment, he gets thrown through the sky view uh, glass window. And don't worry, he'll probably be back any minute. <laughs> Is he? No, he's alive, barely. I mean, it's just this kicks off a, a fight scene, and insert fight noises. Insert fight one music. Of the 
Well, the fight, fight music, music, but also we get the the Mikey and Foot Clan. Right, that's the first thing. Sorry, before they full on start brawling. Oh, a fellow chucker, eh? They have a a, a chuck off. The way that the Foot guy does it, I feel he would have really hurt himself. <laughs> you just because he was smacking him. Yeah, he was he was hitting himself, and just the way that it was. He was doing it. It's just I never understood nunchucks as an actual martial art weapon when they're doing like the stuff around their, you know, um, bodies and stuff. But it's just it's so taboo to see a nunchuck being used because they're like deemed illegal and the worst ninja weapon of like the eighties and nineties. <laughs> He's doing it, and you see through his mask just one tear coming down. That's why they have the bug eyes on. <laughs> <laughs> so you can't see it. So you can't see him cry. Well, I like how as they're both chucking back and forth, that everybody stops, and then it's not like oh, there's going to be a fight. It's one shows off, the other takes time to show off, <laughs> then they stop, the other one shows off. But then the even the Foot Clan member, when he does something, and then Mikey does something, it's not like oh, I'm going to fight you. He's just looking at him like oh, okay. And then he like, hold does on, Steve, hold bad. on. I, I want to watch this. Yeah. Like, <laughs> it, it makes me almost think that it's like, okay, so under different circumstances, these two might be friends. Yeah. But it's like, oh, Mikey, I, like, I love nunchucks tricks. since I was a kid. I've never, ever met anybody else that does nunchucks. Oh, I forget. I think that's Leaf. <sighs> that's one of the turtles. Yeah. That's doing um, the nunchucking. The, fe- the, the fellow chucker. Yes. Like, that's his cameo, though you don't see his face. You see his eye, I believe though. that's he was, Donatello. I think, like, every single foot soldier, you never see their eyes. They have that, like, wire mesh over them. But this is the yeah. only one where you could actually see through it in the other eye. Because the left one looked fine, and then the right one was almost completely transparent. And I feel like they wanted to show a little bit more just because of who was behind the mask this time. Hmm. You notice that? Cause you, oh, I see what you mean. I see what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point. Thanks. I try. I think as a kid, I never understood what Michelangelo was actually doing, like with his nut, his nunchuck at the end, when he's like, "Keep practicing." I don't, I didn't understand that he was like spinning it like a globe trotter, like a ball on his on his finger. I don't know what I thought. Like his, <laughs> I didn't understand well, what he was doing. I, I read the Defy Gravity. Well, also I read like one interpretation. Um, of the when he's spinning it and he's like yawning as he's holding it up in front of the the Foot Clan guy that he has three fingers and he's doing it with his middle finger as he's spinning it. So it's like, oh, so the kids see him spinning this thing and it's oh, that's fun. But he could also look at it as like, you know, he's doing it while he's flipping off this guy during a fight. That's a good point. <laughs> So, yeah, Mikey starts spinning like a globetrotter, and then pretty much uh, the, the real fight starts. Is it Donnie that jumps over and just starts Yeah, Donnie, I think, does like a point? jumping kick behind them yeah. and then comes back in. During these fights are really like the part where he's like, okay, maybe is this the kid's part? Because there's some like goofy sound effects and uh, well, like Donnie's spitting water in the guy's face after using the fish tank. Yeah, I feel like also the the score here seems more, I don't know, like childish or more kid you're, friendly. Yeah, than, you're absolutely right. Than the rest of the movie. And I wonder if they purposely did the music that way to try to lessen the fact that, yep, it's a serious scene and we're about to have a big fight. Right. Yeah, it's like fluttery flute kind of stuff. It's, it's cartoonish. Yeah, like if they just played like T-U-R-T-L-E power and just like... Blasted it during them just tearing apart these guys. Rain and blood by Slayer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, you have me on board for that. I might re-edit this. <laughs> I do like the jokes that kids don't necessarily get. Like when Mikey's spinning, he's like, Donnie, Wheel of Fortune, dude. And Donnie spins Mikey on a shell and he's just like whipping people with his nunchucks as he spins. Hey, Donnie, Wheel of Fortune, dude. I guess they're not game show fans. And I thought everybody loved Venom. <laughs> Just that stuff. That stuff goes over kids' heads, unless they're huge uh, Wheel of Fortune fans, which maybe they could be. I was a Jeopardy child. 
<laughs> I mean, so Wheel of Fortune was huge. We look down on Wheel of Fortune fans. Tim, no. <laughs> we don't want to isolate any of our viewers. It's okay. I liked Wheel of Fortune. <laughs> the poll begins now. Hashtag Jeopardy, hashtag Wheel of Fortune. They bring in like these giant axes, the Foot Clan, and as they're attacking, uh, what was it, Donnie or Mikey? Yeah, I think these guys are lumberjacks. No joke. The only thing safe in the woods would be the trees. <laughs> because they're just like swiping around the room missing. Um, speaking of that, they, yeah, they've got these axes or I don't know what kind of martial art. Yeah, they look like are, small think, halberds or something, which is how. Yeah, that's right. Yes, right. I think it's like a hal- type of halberd. Which um, didn't look sharp whatsoever, but it destroyed the floor <laughs> over the course of the scene. <laughs> yeah. After three or four swings, the, the floor is chewed to hell. And uh, more foot are jumping in from the hole where they threw Raph through. Donnie's like, I don't think structurally speaking, this is a great time for your buddies to drop in. <laughs> because they collapse the floor after a few of them jump in and they fall into April's antique shop downstairs. Oh, no. Where they just uh, continue fighting. Or is Tatsu's there right away, right? Yes. Yeah, they fall down. Once they regain themselves, uh, that's when Tatsu Tatsu's joins. Tatsu's there waiting with more foot. And they just uh, keep fighting. Keep the fight going downstairs. I love his... Uh... The sign language he does to tell all the the... foot to fight. In all of these movies, too, whenever you see, like, the number two in command, he's always a joke. But Tatsu, it just consistently delivers every single time he's on screen. (laughs) I don't know who I would not want to go up against more, Tatsu or Shredder. Shredder, obviously, is, like, the big bad and no one wants to go up against him. But, I mean, if I ran into Tatsu, that would be just as bad. Yeah, I feel like in this, it's if Shredder wasn't around or if Shredder wasn't a part, Tatsu could easily be the big bad Uh and be the head of this team. Right. Middle management for life. He he tried. You tried at the beginning of two. (laughs) Yeah. I forgot. Our leader. Gone. (laughs) I lead. Master Shredder. (laughs) Um, So the... Turtles are kind of getting their asses handed to, the, handed to them down here during this part of the fight. Um, and that's when Casey Jones, who had seen Raphael earlier from across the way, shows up with his mask on, goalie hockey stick in hand. I like how he has that camaraderie with Raph even after the whole thing. Because even though right. the, their whole fight didn't end well for Raph anyway, you could tell Casey had a lot of respect for the guy afterward. He had no right. contempt or anything like that. He's like, hey, man, no one messes with my friend. Um, <laughs> immediately just starts hitting on April, like, <laughs> in this situation. Wastes no time. Guy is smooth. <laughs> smooth is one word for it. <laughs> He's not really smooth. He's not. I love it. It's, uh, Leo's like, who the heck is that? Wayne Gretzky? On steroids? Tatsu's like, whatever the fuck, just attack him too. And they just start fighting again. I like how Casey Jones fights Raph in the beginning of the movie. Has no reason whatsoever to come help other than what? He doesn't like the Foot Clan or he just doesn't like a an unfair fight? No, I think it's just Probably he has that, that, he has yeah. that uh, mutual respect for the guy. I mean, he knows like Raphael is good hearted because of the nature of their meeting. Even though he inconvenienced Casey's uh, will. So he's like, oh, this guy is probably a good guy. He's getting the shit beat out of him. I also like fighting. So I'm... Because, I mean, in the comics, he's like a crazy person. Like a crazy vigilante. So he's just like, I'm down for a fight. Let's go check it out. Um, obviously, the movie's a much more down-to-earth, nicer guy. You gotta be a little bit crazy to be just a masked vigilante, though. Yeah, and you gotta streamline a lot of comic book development that happens over 30 right. issues like cram it down right. at, even though it's an hour and a half movie cram it down to 10 minutes yeah i like that we don't really get casey's backstory it's like we just he's a vigilante obviously he's out doing the same thing the turtles are doing and he likes sports <laughs> he likes sports and that's it we don't need to hear his whole thing and but his character still makes sense to me yeah um so they duck out the back casey covers them they escape in the my dream car, a Volkswagen bus. 
<laughs> it's probably this movie that made me want this a Volkswagen bus so bad, even though it's barely in the movie. I'm like, that's the turtle van. And it's real. They actually make this. Isn't that just the mystery machine? No, this machine, mystery, mystery machine is like a squared off van. It's different, dude. Not to digress, but someone actually had one at Stop and Shop uh, a couple months back. It was so weirdly placed because it's like, why is this here? But someone had. What do you the, mean? Had one a Volkswagen bus or like a? No, a mystery machine. <laughs> oh. Like it was fully painted like fully up. It had the graffiti out. on oh, the wow. side. I, they had like the stuffed animals of like Scooby Doo on the dashboard. It was just cool to see out in the wild for no reason. And the thing is, is like that thing was parked there for every time we would go pick up groceries. It was it was there. So it wasn't like it was just there for like one day. It was there for the course of like at least a, like two month period. Guess they're still working on that mystery. So they escape in the van. Tatsu shouts Ninja Banish, which I guess is just, you know, it's what you say when you want to leave. Well, also, have we said that Charles calls and leaves a voicemail that Casey oh, hears right. fire right. in April? What? April, it's Charles. I'm sorry. I don't know how else to say this. You're fired, April. I'm sorry. I, I forgot leading up to that point and I still missed it. What caused the fire? Um, He, the, one of the foot swings the halberd and hits an elect, electrical like a line. circuit breaker? He gets electrocuted. And oh, that, he's dead. Oh, so there's at least. and starts a fire somewhere. So there's one casualty in this whole movie. Yeah, yeah. he definitely is dead. I mean, he, he makes... Like, oh, he's dead. He's dead. In reality, he'd be dead right away. Like Marv from Home Alone. Instant death. Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, like Raiden, that one move. Raiden was all. So the gang escapes and. We cut to a super pissed off Shredder who is walking like Darkness does in Legend. He's like <laughs> making a beeline towards Splinter, just walks right up to him and slaps him, well, backhands him in, across the face. And he's got his bladed hand things on too. So it, they make it sound like a punch, but I don't know how he didn't get sliced. Oh, from you know what? Either. That might be why he's bloody later on. Could be. Because it's almost in the he's same He's already spot. bleeding a little bit in this. Yeah. So he's just like demanding of Splinter to tell him like what these turtles are. How do they know how to fight? And Splinter's like doesn't say shit because he's Splinter. And uh, Shredder just stares daggers at Tatsu. Just stops and I, stares at yeah. him. And Tatsu immediately knows. He's just like I fucked up. I like how he reprimands him by standing next to him. No words. <laughs> nothing. You just see him yeah. stand next to Tatsu and just turn his head. Slowly Tatsu face just like changes yeah. to like terror and then like shame. And then he just goes berserk in the locker room. Which if Tatsu fought the turtles as hard as he fights his own team in the locker room they'd be done by now. <laughs> right. I think, yeah, the, I'm pretty sure the one he beats up pretty bad is the one, that, like the new foot soldier that they anointed earlier. Oh, could be. I didn't really uh, recall or pay attention. I, it did seem a little weird, too, that uh, they showed his face. Because you see it when he gets his mask, and then it, I think it's the same kid. But I think in the script, he was supposed to be killed. He was supposed to be dead. But they're like, well, let's soften this up. And he's like still breathing. I think at this point, because Danny's watching too, the way that they showed the mask removal, probably me overthinking it again. But I like this critical approach. With them removing the mask, it shows instead of faceless stormtroopers, that there's a person underneath there and Danny at this point also begins to realize the error of his decision of turning in Splinter. Because after this point, he clearly goes back to what's it called? The um, the lair and he hides out there, I guess. Hope, I don't know why he goes back, right. but he is um, he starts talking to Splinter more and he doesn't want to participate in the legal shit that the foot clan is doing at this point right which i kind of find it hard to feel bad for danny because 
Danny talks with Splinter and he talks about how like, oh yeah, my my dad doesn't care. Okay, so because you feel your dad and you don't have a great relationship, you not only joined the Foot Clan, but you purposely went and gave the location of somebody that you knew they're probably to go beat up or kill. Right. Because you were, what, upset that your dad doesn't get you enough stuff? Like your bot, like your dad's coworker, like that you probably like you seem to know very well. Yeah, <laughs> like he they go to April's. He watches April's place burn when they attack it. Like he's off watching from the wherever. Danny, you're that you're that punk bitch, Danny. You're Danny. Danny. You're that punk bitch, Danny. Danny. <laughs> Splinter's like come closer, and then he comes closer. He just bites his neck. <laughs> <laughs> You son of a bitch! <laughs> Never lower your eyes to an enemy. <laughs> I taught Tatsu that. <laughs> Tatsu spring splinter. They both take down Shredder together. My man on the inside. <laughs> My fifth son. So the gang heads to April's family's old farm up. Up in New York somewhere, I guess. Connecticut. I'm assuming they just went. I oh, thought it was, it was Connecticut. I thought it was Connecticut, but it could be New York because it seemed weird that living in Connecticut, it's only like a two hour, uh, at most a two and a half hour drive at the furthest point of Connecticut to get to New York City. So why did it take them a long drive to get there? So it has to be upstate New York. Because, yeah, if they're in New York City, they can get to Connecticut in, what, 30 minutes? Yeah, 30, yeah. 45 minutes, 30 they minutes. Maybe in Stanford within the hour. Yeah. <laughs> Technically, this is all in North Carolina, but for the intense, the purpose of the movie, it's probably New York. So they get to the farm and immediately start to try to repair the van which i guess has shit the bed even though it took them the whole way there but casey can't fix it it's got a um, crack the size of the san andreas <laughs> <laughs> then he just kind of casually spills the beans to april because she mentions her job he's like oh yeah about that um you're fired i need to get to a phone and i need to call my boss you mean charles how did you know that well he left a message on your machine just before we got out and well, hey, you just saved yourself an eight-mile round tripper. Uh, you were fired. I'm... I just saved myself? Yeah. Uh-oh. What did you do? Did you take classes in insensitivity? Yeah, which, like, not his fault. He came no. out of the kindness of his heart to help protect them, and he stayed behind to hold them off in a burning building. And managed to take a call for her. Well, he didn't take the call. He just kind of listened as he was... True. <laughs> it would have been better if he took the call. <laughs> He's fighting them. Hold on. Tell April she's fired. Will do. Who is April? <laughs> <laughs> is that the purple... Uh, one the purple it's the one with the staff and the one with the two sticks tied by a chain. <laughs> <laughs> um... They can do a shouting match, and April storms off. Casey storms off. They both slam doors, and Donnie has a great line. Gosh, it's kind of like moonlighting, isn't it? <laughs> so we just kind of get a, a whole sequence here on the farm. Um, April, we see that she's a sketch artist, and she's uh, damn good drawing the too. turtles. And What's that? Damn good one, too. Yeah, pretty good. She's drawing, and... We hear her narrating, like, about what, how everybody's dealing with the, uh, what they're going through. Casey is fixing a truck with Donnie, and they're calling each other very PG names. I like how they're doing it alphabetical, <laughs> too. Yeah. Well, I like how they lose track, and then he just asks, wait, where are we again? Phone goid. All right, here it goes. What are we on? Uh, G. Here goes, Gak face. I'm ready, hose brain. Uh, Leonardo's just sits with an unconscious Raphael. Um, which, hold, hang on. How long has Raphael been out? Because if is he unconscious or is he just sleeping? Because well, he got the shit beat out of him, so he's probably just he's probably out for maybe a day or two. 
I mean, that's severe brain trauma. If well, you're the best thing oh, yeah. for a concussion is to sleep it off. <laughs> that's the one. That's like another one of these logical things in the movie where it's like he, if he's unconscious, like he's very, very injured. He's not okay. The same Raph isn't waking up. But okay, you know what? I talk myself out of it. He is a mutant. He is mutated. We don't know what that means for his physiological it's, it's like hibernating so being, his healing factor can kick in yeah you can't yeah, fall asleep ask him questions because he is a mutant <laughs> he is a mutant <laughs> ask him questions what seven times seven <laughs> stuff he knows <laughs> what is that from i don't know it's a sound bite on tiktok i know it's from a movie if it's a concussion you have to keep her conscious okay ask her questions what's seven times seven stuff she knows I've seen an art piece that is just Leo sitting on the stool like that, and I really want to buy it. Yes, I want that. I, I would love that set of uh, the art paintings. Yeah. Like, I would hang all of those in my room here. I've seen lots of reproductions. Like, that'd be like an admit. I'm sure those would cost. I mean, people will pay thousands and thousands of dollars for that set of original sketches. I wonder where the, who has those. I wonder who originally did the sketches for the movie. April. Oh. Judith Hogue did Pro all of them on set, <laughs> live. I would assume probably just whoever did the production art for the movie, probably. Previs. Yeah, so we get we don't get a Mikey thing, because I guess we talked about that earlier. Mikey's sequence here is kind of like neutered, or there's not really a Mikey arc. Well, uh, I like how even though, like, the whole thing of Leo sitting there watching Wrath... We've seen them fight throughout the movie. We don't have any sort of spoken thing right now, but just watching Leo and how he's acting, sitting and just kind of keeping vigil over Raph, I think works so well with everything we've seen between the two of them so far in this movie. Yeah, they get on each other's yeah. nerves, but clearly, you know, Leo cares. Yeah. Like, Nothing I think these are the reasons family. why I feel like it really does feel like brothers. So soon after that, Raphael starts to wake up. Say it, Nick, say it. He wants some food! He wants some food! Mm. Bring some food! Donnie and uh, April show up. <laughs> this is where we see <laughs> Donnie makes a joke. This is a Kodak moment and laughs. And just for a couple With frames. both his mouths. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> just for a couple frames. Stuff he pauses when his mouth is wide open. You nightmares. See you see the actor's teeth inside laughing along with him. <laughs> That's going to be the poster for the episode. <laughs> just cut out the head and just like make it fill up the square there. Um, so now that Raph is awake, we see Shredder back in New York brooding, wondering why their fighting style seems so familiar. Hint, hint, it's because you killed Splinter's master and he taught them everything they knows. We also learn that Danny has abandoned the Foot Clan supposedly and is hiding out somewhere because they can't find him. Big twist as if Danny wasn't leaving the Foot Clan and it was a ruse. That way you can find out where the turtles went afterwards. That two-faced bitch Danny. Who's that punk bitch Danny? Danny? What's that called? A triple spy or a... Double agent? Triple agent. Triple agent. Stealing from Shredder to give to the turtles just to give back to Shredder. <laughs> <laughs> TVs won't steal themselves. We're treated to a training montage on the farm. Boys are getting back in the form, getting Raph back to his form. Everybody's forming up. <laughs> They're practicing forms. Filling out forms. <laughs> Casey is dicing vegetables with Leo's katana, which is a funny image. Casey, I don't know if this shoulder massage is entirely consensual. Like he grabs April's shoulders and like sits her down on the chair yeah they have a weird antagonistic relationship he's good-hearted but he's an idiot and way too yes. aggressive at time. i don't know i mean it it, wor it looks like it worked but she throws it right back at him so i guess it works but i don't yeah. know she's she's definitely a match for him um he's a he's a beautiful hot idiot <laughs> leonardo's out meditating and has makes some kind of connection to Splinter and realizes he's alive and gets all the guys to go out uh, that night for a good old 
fire meditation, a seance. To see the... F- <laughs> he sensed the disturbance in the force. Yeah. He needed his yeah. brothers to complete the ritual so they can commune with uh, Force Ghost Splinter. <laughs> Well, I like how he goes back and he's like, Splinter's alive. And he's like, yeah, we all think Splinter's alive. And he says, I don't think I know. And it's this point where it gets supernatural for like six minutes. Maybe they just had like peyote or something beforehand. (laughs) We all have to go on a spirit (laughs) quest. Guys, I got this crazy mushroom we could put on our pizzas. (laughs) Splinter showed me in the forest. (laughs) (laughs) it it zooms in and his pupils are completely dilated all four of them (laughs) the ones on his face the ones in his nose in his mouth (laughs) on on one hand it's supernatural on the other hand their eyes are closed the whole time so i don't know if it's just the the movie just uses the visual representation of splinter being there but then again, if they're all experiencing this, then that's something. So, and plus the blue flames look cool. They do. They do. No, the The suits are a little noticeable here because they're sitting and they're like you know they're crunching forward and their shells are bending and the belt is cutting into their shells and it's like well that's obviously latex foam. You can also see the eye slits that they see out of underneath the bandana. Oh, yeah, right. Underneath the bandana. It's yeah. the only point where I was able to see it. The whole rest of the movie, yeah, barely you can even tell. 95% pretty good. Uh, after that, they uh, approach Casey and April on the bench out on the porch and uh, like, it's time to go back. It's like they're standing and against the sunset and then that driving music starts as they yeah. cut over. Yeah. Always gets me amped. Yes. Pretty much just cuts. They drive right to the manhole near their sewer layer and uh, it's pouring rain and it's just, they don't want to go. They Casey doesn't want to, obviously doesn't want to go down into the sewer. He's like freaked out. This is great. It's great. First it's the farm that time forgot. Now this. Why don't I ever fall in with people who own condos? (laughs) Well, I like how Casey has no skin in the game and he's still here. It's, I don't want to go down in the sewer, but he still does. And it's Casey, you can you can cut and run at any point, bud. But he's still here to stick it out for his new turtle friends. How? I mean, that's that's just it. Like how when you're like a transient, I don't know if he's a transient. I don't know what Casey does <laughs> other than fight crime. But how do you turn away from this once you realize what you're dealing with? And be like, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm fucking in it. You don't have a lot of chances I'm at here. network, probably. <laughs> My boss at Staples is never going to believe this. <laughs> and plus, he hang out with four turtles and April O'Neil. It's not a bad deal. How, how did Danny know where the lair was? Do you think somebody in the clan told him? They probably, uh, he might have overheard or mentioned something. That was another something. logic thing. It was like, he knew where April's lived, but I don't know about the lair. Tatsu, like, drops a pin on maps. <laughs> saves it as a location. So Danny is hiding in, like, a lo- locker closet here inside the lair. And, uh, it'd be funny, because they hear a noise and all the turtles form up outside. And Leo just stabs through the slit before they can open one. <laughs> <laughs> Stab. I liked how he's like, don't right shoot. And then Casey's just, it's not loaded, kid. That's a rap's line. <laughs> oh, it was? Danny, don't shoot. I don't think it's loaded, kid. Danny, what are you doing here? You're that punk bitch, Danny. Danny? Stabs two blades through it. Stop, <laughs> it's me, Danny. We know, Danny. That's why we're doing it. That was for Splinter. Charles sends his regards. <laughs> Chief Stearns. <laughs> There's a pizza noid in the closet too. I just realized. Is there the, well, like the, the, the Domino's, Domino's noid? Yeah. Yeah. So Danny begs April not to tattle on him. Oh yeah, that's the one guy that's known for tattling through this whole movie. <laughs> yeah, Danny's pretty chummy with all of them, considering that he, like, I I don't think they know it, but the fact that Danny's cool with it that it's. Yep, I sold you guys out, got your dad taken away, you all got beat up, your friend got put into a coma, her house got burnt to the ground. Mind if I hang out with you guys? Tell Raphael 
that it was me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm saying at this point, they don't know that Danny got Splinter captured. Yeah. Oh, wait. So, oh, no, I mean, wait. I'm sorry. That was the Foot Clan. Danny didn't have anything to do with the capture. But he did have something to do with Raph getting his ass kicked. Probably just as bad. Oh, wait. So, he... I was trying to remember the the timeline. So, he doesn't announce at the the annual keynote meeting for the first he, sewer raid. No. He announces where April's is. Correct. Because he saw that Mikey under the table. Yeah. Uh, uh, uh. Still, um, what a schmuck. Yeah, schmucky. <laughs> so they ask if there's any pizza. <laughs> well, before that, Donnie's like... What is all this talk about spending the night down here? Mm, you're a claustrophobic. Do you want a fist in the mouth? Mm-mm. I've never even looked at another guy before. <laughs> what he means is that you're afraid of enclosed areas. <laughs> that joke went way over my head as a kid. Yeah, the pizza scene's great, too. Mm-hmm. Well, question. Do you like penicillin on your pizza? I still do that when there's food that goes bad in the fridge. I do the same. I discovered I was old a couple of years ago when I was doing, and part of my job, I onboard new hires with their IT equipment. There was a bunch of interns that came in, and they're all in their early 20s. So they're pretty young, considering this movie came out a good like decade before they were even thought of. So to commemorate all of the interns coming in, they ordered pizza, but the pizza was late. So as a joke, I said, you know, forgiveness is divine, but never pay full price for late pizza. I was met with a room full of silence and everyone looking at me weird. And I'm like, man, uh, never mind. You're so wise. <laughs> <laughs> so they hunker down for the night. Uh, Casey doesn't. He goes up and sleeps in the truck. And then Danny's tossing and turning because he's disturbed by, you know, a situation. And what is he going to do? Well, he decides to, at least in the middle of the night, hightail it back to uh, foot headquarters and tell shredder casey tell shredder everything <laughs> strike with guilt donnie wakes up and danny's hunched over him with a knife he was believing in splinter until he saw four walking turtles like i can't handle this <laughs> it's the end times you talk to the most normal guy i know a rokusaki my dad my real dad <laughs> shredder daddy <laughs> um casey tails him back to the hideout which I think like Casey, he kind of hides from the foot that walks by, but I feel like he fits right in. Unless like he's obviously not a teenager, but he's kind of dressed like everybody else. He looks like a hoodlum type. He goddamn hoodlums. Danny gets back and goes right to Splinter, who dishes on um, his actual origin story. Where he came from in Japan, we get the whole Rokusaki Hamato Yoshi backstory about they were competing for a woman and instead of trying to win the woman, Orokusaki just kills her <laughs> so nobody can have him. Well, they fled to America and Oroku followed them and kills the woman and kills Splinter's master, Hamato Yoshi. But it's too late. He's already acquired all of Hamato's <laughs> ninja, <laughs> ninja skills. I thought you were going to say all of his uh, you know, home electronics. <laughs> <laughs> He probably, he definitely ate Hamato Yoshi, right? Like, after. I think that's how you become uh, a Wendigo, not a Shredder. (laughs) (laughs) Splinter definitely feasted on Hamato and his wife. Um, That's how he learned everything. And then the turtles are there and he, he like, takes out a little pouch and he's like, here, I brought you some Hamato Yoshi. (laughs) <laughs> feast Hamato jerky <laughs> it's freeze dried Hamato um, so Rokusaki yeah kills the master in front of them Splinter leaps and scratches Oroku's face so he's got this massive scar or you know deep scratch along his mouth I'm impressed too that uh, Splinter was able to learn all of this 
before he touched any of the ooze. <laughs> yeah, it really speaks to animal biology. What what are what do rats how much do they know? Do we need to be worried about rats? So not only can they cook and take over and mind control a chef in a French restaurant, but they can also watch a Japanese martial artist and teach four turtles the same skills. Well, those are the two big things they're known for. Yes, of course. Well, I just respect Splinter for still being a like a, a non-ooze mutant rat and just springing from his thing to just attack this guy. Yeah. It's like, wow, you uh, you dealt more damage to him than Yoshi did. Do you think, so Splinter harbored no ill will for being kept in a cage his whole life? He did, that wasn't weird to him, I guess. Maybe he was into it. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe the cage was just a formal thing they did, and most of the time he lived outside the cage. But I still deep down want a prequel that shows the life of Splinter as he's trying to raise the four kids. I would dig that. When they're still like infancy. And Netflix or HBO Max limited. Who's the antagonist? Baxter Stockman. <laughs> Only Baxter and his mousers. Um, so we're treated out of that memory. We go back to the warehouse where we get that 90s jam spin that wheel by high tech three <laughs> with your kid K. That's exactly what my notes said. That is a hot, that's a hot jam, huh? It is. That's a really it's, sign of the time. Every time it pops up, it gets stuck in my head for days. It's that hook, man. Casey nabs a foot soldier and steals his uh, outfit. And we cut back and Danny has taken off the dragon doji symbol. And Shredder's like, what the fuck are you doing? He's a quadruple and, agent. Um, <laughs> I'm back, I'm back, I'm back double cross you to work with splinter and shredder's like you too and then he takes his helmet off <laughs> wait we're both working for splinter splinter takes this helmet and puts it on himself <laughs> yes daddy it was all a test you own the factory now you get nothing you lose good day sir shredder realizes danny has been with the turtles because he's got april's sweet leonardo sketch <laughs> also he smells like a sewer <laughs> you smell like penicillin pizza they muster the rohirrim and go after the turtles <laughs> not before ordering tatsu to kill splinter and that's just when casey comes by and uh they realize they gotta save splinter so they go and do that i love too once casey sees splinter he has that second of shock and then it's just <laughs> at this point he just rolls with it yeah, because he's like, well, I mean, I've seen four huge turtles, so <laughs> that's a great little performance by Elias there. It hit me in the feels a little, too, and just the way that he's taking Splinter down from the chains and he asks, who are you? And he's just, I'm a friend like that. Yeah, yeah. I love that. Yes, I agree. <laughs> It does a flashback to Casey Jones and his origin that lasts 15 minutes. Well, you see, sir. Do you have a minute? <laughs> it cuts back. Shredder and all the foot clan are around them. Oh, well. Splinter's dead. Danny's dead. <laughs> He's got a knife sticking out of him, but he didn't realize this. Then Casey oh, Jones shit. put the Shredder helmet on. I had four golf clubs and I gave them all names. <laughs> 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 Frida. Um, damn it, I lost my. That's joke. one. I couldn't think. I was like <laughs> Salvatore Dali, <laughs> Picasso, and Pollock. Sorry, that was. I really fucked up my joke there. All the good ones um, end in O. Ah, no. <laughs> <laughs> All the good ones end in O. <laughs> o. Yeah, Shredder wastes no time because the foot is like on the, goes back to the turtle lair ASAP while Casey and Danny are getting Splinter out of there. But Casey and Splinter are intercepted by Tatsu, grunting Tatsu. <laughs> I love it when Casey mocks Tatsu's grunts. 
<laughs> like that that I laughed out loud. Every time I see that I laugh out loud when he mocks his grunt. He's just so serious um, through the whole movie and finally someone calls him out on it. Yeah. Um so it's some pretty decent um you know action here. Well, so they have the second turtle raid down in the sewer. Ah, but they are ready this time. Yeah, there's like the the smoke screen and then just they the demolish yeah. all of them. It kind of calls back to the beginning of the movie. It's kind of a horrifying scene, though, considering the steam was enough to knock them out because you don't hear any fighting sounds. At least I don't think I did. So I, I thought think they, they beat just... them up in the smoke or no, in the I, steam. I, I thought they just burnt them alive. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's why I don't remember. I see, I hear, I saw the steam. I didn't hear any fight noises. And then you see one of the turtles close the valve, and then all the foot soldiers are on the ground. And then you see the turtles come out from, you know, where they are hiding. So I was just thinking, like, damn, they, they just burnt them alive. Jeez. Oh, wait, no, I'm confirming there is fight noises. There is. Okay. I mean, what would I be hear twirling weapons and whips and like okay. some smacks? Yeah, Could you imagine not. being the Foot Clan showing up though, and then all the steam, but then all of them start screaming like Raph when he comes running out in the beginning of the subway? <laughs> you just hear it all around you, everywhere in the sewer. I mean, they are in a sewer to have like hot steam in that room. I can only imagine the smell. No thanks. <laughs> So while the tur turtles are doing pretty well against the foot and pushing them back out of the sewer, Tatsu starts to kick Casey's ass. Um, Casey just tries to, you know, funny man, talk his way through it, be a tough guy. It's gonna cost you, Tinkerbell. I don't think, I don't think that you're listening. <laughs> Tatsu knocks him down and uh, right on top of a pair of golf clubs. A <laughs> pair of golf a clubs. A pair of, you know. They come in pairs, don't they? You have one for long and one for short. That's how golf works. <laughs> he, he, uh, Tatsu's like coming over to like finish him off and Casey slips the, the driver out of the trash underneath him or whatever. Hits him in the gut with like the, br the, the handle of it and that makes Tatsu double over. And then he just fucking drives him right into the face. <laughs> Flies across the room. It's comical, but um, I mean, not comical, but unrealistic, but pretty awesome. I mean, I'd like to know the club that doesn't shatter, seen as I think they're what, like graphite <laughs> or something like that. I've accidentally <laughs> shattered a driver, like at the driving range. I'll never call golf a dog game again. This is when we get the family. Sam Rockwell's uh, Oscar winning performance right here. This is the Oscar clip. Actually, what are we just standing here for? Let's get him. Do you want to be first, Junior? Huh? We have a loyalty to the Shredder. The Shredder uses you. He poisons your minds to obtain that which he desires. He cares nothing for you or the people you hurt. We're a family. You 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 call this here and that down there family? I like it because the scene shows the kids aren't here because they want to be criminals. Like they just feel left out. They aren't accepted. They're not seen. Like they will take any semblance of family that they can get, even if it's something like this. Yeah. Kids just need structure in their lives. That's all it is. Like you take out Tatsu and they just break. They're like, oh, okay, well, I'm... I mean, there goes the free cigarettes. <laughs> um, I, it's hilarious. <laughs> they're beating the turtles it cuts back to their fight and the turtles are beating the foot so bad they're just like crawling out of the sewer like just like escaping like let us alone <laughs> which they're like hey where are you going and they continue to kick their asses like a lot of times in some of the other movies we've covered it annoys me when there's characters that are just always like the i keep going back to it but like in willow the uh, frangine and rank or whatever laughing and joking when things are happening but i feel like with the turtles they can laugh and joke because they have outclassed the foot clan so badly that it's like yep our brains are just on autopilot we can just have right. a conversation during this <laughs> yeah like donnie and mikey like deciding one-liners while just yeah fending people off easily 
Also, I think this is the first time we get the phrase, God, I love being a turtle! He's very genuinely excited about being a turtle. It's very advantageous. Very at pro that time. turtle. <laughs> they could pack to the surface and keep fighting them all the way up to the roof of the building and dispatch them. And that's when Rokusaki drops in in a pretty cool Most badass manner. entrance ever. Yeah. It is cool. And I love, like, I know it's fake, but I love these New York City backdrops on the roof during all of this. Yeah, it, it looks just, good. It looks cool. And then him just, like, with the music and just, like, slowly dropping down into frame and chef's kiss. It's a movie trope with always seeing with a group of guys and uh, they never gang up on, like, their one target. But in this case, with them doing the fight with Shredder individually, one-on-one -on -one combat, it felt like there's a lot more at stake and they intentionally did that versus just, I'm only going to fight, only Raph is going to fight him right now, no one else. But in this case, it's like they all wanted a piece of him. Yeah, which I think it's also because if Splinter raised them to be honorable, to them it's, yeah, it's four-on-one. We're not going to gang up on the guy. So it's, okay, who's up next? I mean, I think at one point they... It seems like they are trying after the after the initial round of oh yeah after Shredder, they got Shredder like throttled them. yeah and that was also when um, uh, Shredder goads them into attacking. Where's Splinter? Ah, oh, the rat. Huh? So it has a name. It had a name. Uh, you lie. Do I? Which. I like how after they're all doing the one-on-ones and they're getting beat, and then Mikey is like, at exactly what point did we lose control here? <laughs> at that point, they should be just going after him from all sides. We see Casey arrive and like everybody's kind of down there listening. They realize there's a showdown going on on the roof. Casey's like, oh, there's no more people to fight. So he grabs that nearby garbage truck. Which, in a similar fashion to Harry and the Henderson, somebody just ended their shift and was like, I'm just going to fuck off and leave the carpet <laughs> truck here. Here's a truck with and the keys. keys. It. it was clever <laughs> on how they positioned that the, they got the garbage truck where it was for Shredder. Because that, that's why um, Casey moved it over. He saw more foot soldiers climbing the ladder. Right. So he's yeah. like, you know, let me back this truck up against the ladder to stop them from climbing and it's prevent more from climbing up too. So the guys can right. have their moment. Right. And to build on that, when uh, Leonardo goes over and attacks and gets held at um, spear point, they throw their weapons and Mi they show Mikey's uh, one nunchuck gets stuck on the ladder there. Also, this marks the third time that Raph has lost his size in this film. <laughs> <laughs> Guy can't get a break. He can Casey, get him back. a little help. Another 45 minutes um, of him trying to find it. It lands in the garbage uh, truck. He's down there sifting through it. <laughs> I could get it back. I could get it back. <laughs> <laughs> right before Shredder is, is going to stab Leo, Splinter appears. This is another scene that is perfect for Guile's theme. <gasps> Splinter! Yes, Urokusaki. I know who you are. We met many years ago in the home of my master, Komato Yoshi. And, and your favorite scene, Nick, Shredder just pulls off his mask magically. Magic. To reveal that he is a Rokusaki with the scars that Splinter left him years ago. What if Splinter was wrong? It was I who gave you that. And he pulls the mask off. And it's a different guy. And he's like, who? No, wait. It, he must have gotten plastic surgery. <laughs> Just refuses to believe it's the wrong guy. He looks very different. And Italian now? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe um, it's not the right one. It, it's, it's cool how they re keep reserved how um, badass Splinter is. Because Shredder charges him with the spear. And he just easily, he like wraps the nunchucks around the spear, tosses him over the side. Which 
I love Shredder, but this is the only thing that doesn't make sense for his... I mean, I guess it, unless he just gets so enraged at being like, you're the guy who disfigured me all those years ago. Yeah. He, yeah. He, that it's just... Shredder's cool through the whole fight. And then once he realizes who Splinter really is, that's when he loses his shit and all of his uh, control. Yeah. And yeah. now it's just like bull rush. I, I can buy that. Also, he had him captured and it's like, it's just a feeble old rat. Like, he posed no threat to him at all up until this point. He let his guard down, I think. Splinter reaches into his boot. Sully pulls out a snub nose revolver. <laughs> I wanted you to know it was me, Orokusaki. Splinter, you said we weren't to use guns. I said you were not to use guns. <laughs> I love them. <laughs> he fires them off into the air. <laughs> Pulls out his NRA <laughs> membership card. So Splinter has got Shredder at his mercy. He's hanging off the side of a building by this spear. And uh, that Splinter is holding onto with the nunchucks. He's got him like wrapped around. Splinter's like monologuing, like the good guy monologue. Death comes for us all, Urokusaki. But something much worse comes for you. But as he's talking, um, Shredder pulls out a knife from behind him and just Throws it at Splinter. Splinter at point blank range catches the knife. Badass. Badass. Just but in doing so loses the nunchuck, and that means Shredder's falling off the side of the building. For when you die, it will <laughs> without honor. Do you think Shredder at that point was like Okay, I'm dead, but I'm going to kill him too. Because if he, if Splinter gets hit in the throat with a knife, he's still letting go of the nunchucks. I mean, probably. I mean, if he's mad enough to just like charge at him full force, he's yeah. probably mad enough to be like, yep, we're both yeah, dying here. Let's do it. Uh, Shredder falls several stories into a conveniently placed garbage truck. And then we get straight murder. Whoops. Oops. <laughs> Casey Jones takes this opportunity, doesn't <laughs> doesn't miss a beat, just pulls the com compactor on the garbage truck, and for we years see metal as a child, crushing. I thought that was blood on the hydraulics, but it's just red paint. Because that quick glance, you're supposed to think it's blood, but it's not. Really? Because if it was, and I'm wrong, holy shit, it really looks more like like really badly chipping red paint. But just how visceral that whole scene is. With the music going, too, on how it just sets that tone for Crusher, or the Shredder getting crushed. It's right. going to call him the Crusher. Yeah, it's like Shredder's theme, almost, yeah. playing while, while he gets killed. <laughs> Oops. Uh, and everything's happy hunky-dory. Um, Splinter's Should safe. A slide whistle in there. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> That's that slide whistle from Jurassic Park when Nedry slips. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but but Splinter lets go, and that's when the whistle goes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the press and the Chief Stearns and the police show up at this point, right at right the same time, right at the same time, start arresting foot soldiers. Danny reunites with his dad. He loves his dad now, and... He's legally changed his name to just Dan. Are you okay, Danny? It's okay, Dad. I'm okay. Really. I'm okay. Dad? It's just Dan now, okay? Dan. Are you okay, Danny? It's Dan now. It was like, boy, his, <laughs> his voice, voice is lowered. <laughs> <laughs> it's Dan. Oh, I'm still Dad. <laughs> Chief Stearns talks to Sam Rockwell, head of the Thug Brigade, and uh, Sam's like, head over to the East Warehouse on Lairdman Island. Ah, uh, ah. Uh. Eh, eh. I only realized recently that, that that was put in there. I never really paid attention to what he said. Little subtle callback to the series creators. Subtle, not so subtle. And then April, like, bullies her way back into her job. Good for her. Actually, no. I guess Charles wants her back. And she just, like, 
gets a raise, gets a corner office. I mean, being a longtime reporter, you would think they would have given her a little more of a courtesy termination than just over the right. phone. Yeah. I mean, Casey did kind of save her an eight mile trek, but still. And then Casey and April make out. Good for them. They finally shut up and kiss. Yeah, the turtles are cheering them on, but I think some of those turtles are jealous. They're like, fuck. If only I was human. <laughs> that starts a whole nother sub arc. If only we were human, then Splinter's like, I used to be. <laughs> Depending on continuity. Looks at the camera. And <laughs> just like anamorphs. <laughs> What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> then the movie just cuts to you, Archie. L E. No, 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 no. Come back. Wait a minute. Uh, yeah. So the turtles are just turtles are celebrating, and they're trying to come up with a catchphrase, and they land on the classic insert catchphrase. Ah, oh, not without Splinter's help. Right. Sorry, I fucked that up. So they're celebrating. <laughs> They're trying to come up with a catchphrase, and they don't have jack shit. But Splinter used to surf back in Japan. <laughs> a surf ninja, if you will. <laughs> he was moonlighting with the trash company. He was the one that drove the, the garbage truck there. He he called the car the garbage company, yeah, and had him leave that truck. Damn, he's 5D chessing his way through Shredder. <laughs> um, Cowabunga. He made a funny. Cowabunga! <laughs> I made a funny. <laughs> and then we get our classic 90s end credits talk hip hop rap. A song that Vanilla Ice wishes he wrote. <laughs> Did you? <laughs> One of the lines in the, the song made me laugh. I didn't write it down, but it was something like, somebody get a quarter, I need to get a reporter. <laughs> <laughs> Pizza's the food that's sure to please. These ninjas are into pepperoni and cheese. <laughs> <laughs> Cut it, print it. Was this before or after the cartoon? After. After. I wonder if they polled a bunch of like elementary schools and just asked them for their best rhymes and for a turtle song. Not to take anything away from partners in crime. He did a great job. He did. For creating a rap about turtles? Yeah, I think you did fine. And that's that. This is my... This is Ted like Talk. the childhood movie for me. Like it, It's the one... It's the, it's the crown jewel of my childhood movies. I don't know what's more memorable though. This movie or like the intro commercials. Because it stands out <laughs> just as much. I can. What's the other one other than the the Pizza Hut baseball field one? What's the Burger King one? No, is there a Burger King one? Yeah, with the kids club, the animated kids. That sounds familiar. Oh, you get, guys had the VHS, didn't you, with the commercials before? Yeah. Yes, Tim. Yeah. We know you had a pirated copy from television. <laughs> pirated. <laughs> But I watched the hell out of these, man. Like, I know this VHS must must have been, like, almost wiped clean with how often I, I watched it. Wow. It definitely just, was put through its paces. I just realized that uh, that VH, VHS back then cost 25 bucks. It's like 50 now, right? Yeah. Or it's maybe not that severe, but something that's close to it. One of the that's first. That's a lot of money. One of the first VHSs, I think like Child's Play was one of them. And they wanted like almost, basically it was like $150 in today's money. It was a <laughs> lot. It's crazy to think because I know VHS is a different technology than compact discs and DVDs, but it's like the prices haven't changed. Nope. Surprisingly. They've got they're technically cheaper, I guess. Well, video games too. It's always been like 60 bucks, but it's weird to think that you know, 20 years ago, you're buying a Super Nintendo game and that's $60 and you're still paying 60 So with inflation, it means just that they've gotten cheaper over the years and not more expensive. So you're paying $60 to play like TN TMNT on NES. Are we all going to get the uh, 
the anthology collection. Oh hell releasing. yeah! Hell yes! I'm There'll so be some glad online it's gonna... co-op. I think right. Yep. I'm definitely getting that. I'm so glad it's going to be on Steam. I saw the commercial that was released for PlayStation, and I thought it was a Sony exclusive at first because I could see them doing that. But now knowing that it's going to be on everything, 100%. Final final thoughts? We did, gave final thoughts. My final thoughts are that I, I wasn't worried about will this hold up like some of the other movies. I knew this holds up. Mm-hmm. I watch this like once a year, and it's still like the first time I saw it. It's amazing. I'll admit this was the, actually the first time I actually sat and truly watched it. I've put it on a lot as like background and I'll look over and I'll watch specific scenes, but never actually sat and fully hundred percent paid attention with nothing else going on. The only times I got distracted, I think like my wife came home. So I had to pause it real quick. And um, anytime I would be talk like taking notes and doing the voice to text while the movie was still playing. But usually I caught mostly everything, but it was really interesting to rewatch it again from start to finish in one sitting. Yeah, I'm glad you guys, I mean, I know you guys liked it, but I didn't know as with as much what you really thought of it, I guess, as compared I will say to the that last Teenage movie. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is one of the top 10 films ever made. <laughs> From plot to feel to enjoyment to just craftsmanship, it's one for the ages. Not many people would agree. Well, they are wrong. <laughs> They're wrong. They're all wrong. Not many people would have. Ex- I think would expect. I think. Sorry, what I meant to say was, I don't think many people would expect to think they would enjoy this movie as much as they might just knowing. Oh, it's a Ninja Turtles movie. If they've never seen it. Even if they're an adult. I but mean, I would, at the end of the day... I would the, recommend um, watching this still, like, just to anybody that doesn't know anything about the Turtles. I mean, a movie is supposed to be, you know, something that draws your attention, is able to, uh, like, um, elicit some kind of emotional response to it. And the fact that even after all this time, it's still able to do that for us. I think that stands the quality of, you know, the test of time, as well as just having that quality to it that not many other movies can do they're lighting in a bottle here Uh it deserves its number one spot for as long (laughs) as it did i wonder how much this did for new line too like because they were pretty weren't they almost bankrupt i don't know but they were just like b movie horror and like art house yeah they were the house that freddie built stuff i mean the house that donnie built that's true they were already they were already like had hits and stuff on their hands so I mean, they weren't, it was, they weren't nobodies. Yeah, it was probably why they can take a chance on something like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles because they yeah. knew like we can bank on Nightmare on Elm Street money and the Lord of the Rings. <laughs> Wait, that was New Line. <laughs> yeah, yeah. another. I think MGM movie. fronted some of that money too, but they didn't take. MGM had some part in it, I believe, but it was New Line. Yeah, yeah watch the turtles and we'll be back to talk about seth rogan's turtles in two years or i guess it's coming out 2023 i think can't wait we'll see i i would imagine he would give it more credit and a little more respect or more respect than i mean michael bay michael I bay's give, respect would, for the original yes. treatment before the Bay movie was made, if you said, have Seth and his writing partner make it or have Bay make it, I would have gone with Seth. Well, I mean, they did The Boys, adapted from the the comic, and it's good. They did Preacher, adapted from the comic, and it's good. The hardest part with the Turtles is not the story. It's the look. If you can get the look right, that's the hardest part. I think the comedy too, like the the comedy in the movie, I think hit right for me where it wasn't just like making kids fart jokes or something, you know, like the lines were well timed and were funny lines themselves and weren't just like trying to get kids to laugh. So finding that where it's kid friendly, but also, you know, like Pixar, like it, it, it's well done is is also a challenge, I think, with the turtles. I don't want to be rolling my eyes. Pizza power!
Thanks again for coming along for this adventure as we watch Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. As always, you can find us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, at Screen Refresh, or email us your own movie memories at screenrefresh at gmail.com. If you like the show, help us out and leave a rating and review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts to help others find us. So for Tim and Nick, this is Dean saying goodbye. We'll see you next time and check out Rule of Thirds in a couple weeks. And I'm dead. Smash that like button. You're Danny. Danny? You're that punk bitch Danny. Danny?